have uh, Michael Corrin with us today, who is our moderator, and uh, give him a big hand. <laughs> and uh, Michael, if you will, that's the, it's all yours. This evening's debate. Well, I want to emphasize at the very beginning, and I, I'm, I'm sure this is redundant, but just to remind people, of course, um, respect uh, for everyone participating, because the, it is so important in contemporary Canada in particular, I believe, that ideas are expressed openly. I know some are offended by some ideas. That's the nature of being a grown-up in, in a pluralistic world. Some ideas offend. Get used to it. We coexist. We live together. So respect for people willing to stand here, sit here, participate, and give their opinions. I think it's a wonderful thing, and um, it, it's one of the, the great triumphs of democracy. So your respect all around. I'm sure we will get that. Christianity and Islam. Christianity and Islam being the subject of debate tonight. What we'll have, as with the earlier debates, 40 minutes from each person. 40 minutes each. Then each person has a 15-minute rebuttal and then a five-minute conclusion each, and then questions. You'll write down, if you want to, you'll write down your questions, and we'll read the questions out. Was there to be a second round of rebuttals before the... We can have that, like. We can have two. We may have a second round of rebuttals, so 40, 15, 5, and 5. Uh, Dave Hunt, some of you are new. Uh, you haven't been to the, the debates before, so I will introduce him again for those of you who don't know who he is, not many of you. Uh, Dave Hunt, uh, a best-selling author, researcher, International lecturer of over 30 years, over 4 million books sold, some titles in more than 50 languages. Um, many are available just outside, discussing um, Eastern psychological selfist philosophies, ecumenism, other unbiblical teachings, also great concern over Islamic politics and religion, articles, lectures. He's also a very popular uh, guest lecturer and, and radio personality. Shabir Ali who has been on my television show two or three times. It would be wonderful to have him as a guest. Holds a BA in Religious Studies from Laurentian University in Sudbury, Ontario, <coughs> with a specialization in Biblical Literature. And an MA in Religious Studies from the University of Toronto, with a specialization in Quranic Exegesis. He is pursuing a PhD. How's that going? Pretty good. Pretty yeah. good. <laughs> and a PhD in Quranic Exegesis at the University of Toronto. He's president of the Islamic Information and Dawah Center International in Toronto, where he functions as Imam. He travels internationally to represent Islam in public lectures and interfaith dialogues. He explains Islam on a weekly television program called Let the Quran Speak, which I think is on CTS, is it not? It's a wonderful channel. The first 40 minutes to Dave Hunt, sir. Go ahead. Okay, well, I guess there was a little bit of discussion behind the scenes that I wasn't aware of. Shabir said it was supposed to be it's, uh, uh, the Bible against the Quran, and I thought this was the one. It doesn't really matter because. Uh, the Bible is the foundation of biblical Christianity. The Quran is the foundation of Islam. So we'll probably cover both, both of those. Once again, I want to thank Paul McGregor and the other conveners and sponsors of this series of debates. I think it was a great idea. How many of you think it ought to be done again? Oh, okay. Very good. <laughs> they like debates. Paul debated all the time. He debated daily in the marketplace, in the synagogue. My wife doesn't like debates, and I take some comfort from Paul. Uh, he uh, did it all the time. That was a part of his ministry. Uh, and I want to thank the film crew and Michael Corrin and for being the moderator and the school for renting this out to us. Now, I want to make it very clear, as I have done in each of the pr two previous debates, I'm not here to represent or, pre or defend any religion. Protestantism, Catholicism, Methodism, Methodism, or, Methodism, or, or uh, Calvinism, or Presbyterianism, or anything. I'm here to defend and explain and defend biblical Christianity. The reason for that is because there are a lot of people who call themselves Christians. And I say to them, look, 
Uh, in fact, I was having a little debate with a, a Muslim uh, in Washington, D.C., and he was telling me that Islam is peace. Well, I said, okay, you want to make up a religion, make up any religion you want. But you can't call it Islam. It has a prophet, it has its scriptures, it has a history. And I said, I say the same thing to people who call themselves Christians. You want to, you want to make up a religion? Go ahead. Make up any religion you want. You're free to do that. But you can't call it Christianity unless you follow the teachings and example of Jesus Christ and you get Christianity that you claim to, to, uh, to be following. You get it from the Bible, God's Word. So that's why I define it as biblical Christianity. Uh, now, I'm not here. I've listened to a, at least one debate by Shabir, and I know he loves to quote experts and critics and so forth. Uh, I'm not here to quote the experts. Uh, frankly, there are many experts and they have varying opinions. I'm here just to quote the Bible, just to look to the Bible. I think we ought to let the Bible and the Quran speak for itself. Now that's my opinion. He can uh, do what he wishes. I don't mean, by biblical Christianity, I don't mean Christianity is defined by a church, uh, a denomination, some theologian, some alleged expert. I, I think, you know, we talked about in the Q&A this afternoon, I think the Bible ought to be pretty well self-explanatory. The Quran ought to be also uh, written for the common people. And you shouldn't have to consult of some expert to find out what the Bible is saying or what the Quran is saying. Well then, if I've got to consult an expert about what the Bible is saying, I'm not really in touch with God. Now how do I know the expert knows what he's talking about? Well then I'm going to have to check him out and maybe the guy that he learned this from. And uh, that, you know, in uh, I didn't bring my Bible up, I'll just have to quote it, but that's okay, I don't have room for it here. Um, sad case when you don't have room for the Bible, but that's, there's a small, small podium here. But in Matthew 23, Jesus takes the rabbis to task. Uh, and I'll just put it in my own modern translation. He says, you scoundrels. Not only don't you enter into heaven, you stand in the way of those who would because you set up a system of religion that is so complicated they are at your mercy because you are the only ones who can interpret it. I don't think that's the way Jesus intended it, okay? The God of the Bible is one would reasonably expect. He hasn't left mankind at the mercy of certain experts to interpret what he said. And I don't believe in that, so I don't quote the experts. Um, Shabir loves to quote various supposed biblical scholars, at least in the, the one or two debates of his that I've listened to, historians who criticize the Bible and Christianity, and they don't offer any proof, endless speculation, a tedious series of suppose this or perhaps that, and contradicting one another, I'm going to violate what I just said, and I'm going to quote one critic of Islam. And he'll probably quote plenty of critics of Christianity. Um, Ali Dashti, and I'm sure Shabir knows who he is. He explains that one of Muhammad's followers, Abdul Asar, made many suggestions to the prophet about improving the Quran by rephrasing it, adding to it or deleting from it suggestions which Muhammad, he said, followed. Eventually, however, Sar defected from Islam, having at last faced the obvious fact that if the Quran were truly from God, it wouldn't need to be improved in wording and concepts and could not be changed. When Mecca was conquered, Abdul Asar was one of the first put to death by Muhammad. That's the way they enforce truth uh, in Islam. Uh, I don't want to insult anybody out there, but let me just put it in my terms. Islam is a peaceful religion. And if you don't believe it, we'll kill you to prove it. Uh, that's sort of what goes on. And they killed him, uh, did away with him. 
as a critic. Um, now, I have some problems with that way of enforcing truth. And I don't believe you can enforce truth. So anyone who reads the Bible carefully will conclude that it proves and interprets itself. Uh, So-called biblical scholars have claimed Moses didn't write the Pentateuch, Daniel didn't write Daniel, it was written centuries later by someone pretending to be Daniel, there were two or three Isaiahs, the gospel weren't written to, until a century or more later, ad infinitum absurdum. In response, Christian apologists have written numerous books debunking the critics. I have no time to go into those details, nor is it necessary. I hope to let the Bible, uh, biblical Christianity, speak for itself. Um, I want to try to simplify because I've listened to some debates and they can get very complicated and very involved. I want to try to simplify it, if I can. Uh, first of all, this debate is not over a few details, technicalities, and I don't think Shabir and I, actually, you'll probably find out this evening, I don't think we agree on anything. <laughs> um, Islam is utterly anti-Christian. Uh, I was in, um, where was it, New Zealand, and I got there too late to hear this, but there was a newspaper article saying, oh, we met with, uh, there were um, Anglican leaders, and they met with the uh, Muslim leaders, and, and some of them were saying, oh, we learned so much. Why, we learned that the Quran has more about Jesus than it has about Muhammad. I don't think Shabir or I would agree with that, but it may be coming close, but that's not the point. I thought to myself, did any of these Anglican leaders ask the Muslims, what does the Quran say about Jesus? Oh, it says more about Jesus than it says about, about Muhammad? Well, what does it say about Jesus? Well, it says he's not the Son of God. He didn't die for our sins on the cross. He's not, uh, it denies his deity and so forth. Well, that's what it says? Yes, we'll talk a little bit more about that, and I don't think that Shabir will disagree with me on that. Islam is utterly anti-Christian. It denies every doctrine of biblical Christianity. It denies Jesus is the unique Son of God, equal with, co-equal with the Father. Sixteen times the Quran declares Allah is not a father and he has no son. Well, that's one of the basic teachings of Christianity. Does God have a son? Of course he does. And I don't have to go to the New Testament to find that out. Psalm 2, 7, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Uh, verse, two, verse 12 says, Kiss the son, lest he be angry, and you perish from the way when his wrath is kindled but a little. If you went to Proverbs 30, verse 4, it's talking about the Creator. What is the Creator's name? And what is his son's name? Oh, he has a son. Yes, the Old Testament says that. Isaiah 9, 6 and 7. For unto us a child is born. That's the babe born in Bethlehem. Unto us a son is given. That's the eternal son of God who became a man. The government will be upon his shoulders. Well, that must be talking about the Messiah. His name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father. Daniel 3, 24 and 25, you probably remember the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. You know, they wouldn't bow down to this idol. They were thrown into the furnace. And Nebuchadnezzar comes looking there, and he's astonished. He says, I thought we threw three men in there. There's four of them. And the fourth is like the Son of God. Wow. I think the Bible from uh, Genesis to Revelation tells us that God has a Son. Now, Islam says that belief in the Trinity sends one to hell. You go straight to hell, you believe that? And that's Surah 572. 
the Quran denies the need for redemption, one of the basic teachings of Christianity. It claims that Allah can forgive whomever he will. Without the penalty being paid, he can just be merciful and forgive. It denies that Christ died for our sins on the cross, Surah 4, 157, that he even died on the cross. In fact, it asserts that his death for sin wasn't needed. This is an unjust idea that the innocent should die for the guilty. Instead of Christ dying in our place, the very foundation of biblical Christianity, Islam says, and there are some differences of opinion on this, someone died in his place. He was made. Allah made it appear to the Jews that it was the Son of God who died. Instead of Christ dying in our place, someone died in his place, apparently. Uh, and so it's denying the very foundation of Christianity. He was taken alive to heaven. Islam also denies the resurrection. Uh, another foundational doctrine of Christianity. Uh, this huge attack on Christianity is based on 40 verses in the Quran, and I don't know whether Shabir is going to say something about that. He may, and I don't know whether I'll get back around to it or not. In other words, what I'm saying is Islam is totally anti-Christian. You cannot get more anti-Christian than Islam is. And don't let anyone deceive you by saying anything to the contrary. Well, in examining both Christianity and Islam, there are certain basics that we've got to be concerned, be concerned with. First, by what authority? What authority? Is the Quran? What's the authority behind the Quran? Behind Islam? Uh, for Christianity, it's the Bible, the God of the Bible, and Jesus Christ. For Islam, it's the Quran, the God of the Quran, and Muhammad. Equally important, and I don't want to offend Shabir or any of the Muslims that I see out there in the audience. But I think it's equally important to scrutinize the fruit of Christianity. I'm talking about biblical Christianity and scrutinize the fruit of Islam. What is the fruit of each? Well, I'm only going to present facts. And I don't have time to present many facts. And if we refuse the facts, then we might as well shut the whole thing down. Uh, first for Islam, let's look at a bit of history. Uh, Muhammad fled from Mecca to Yathrib. No, not Medina. It was originally, what's called Medina today, it was originally called Yathrib. Yathrib was a Jewish town founded by Jews. Muhammad killed them all. He even promised them safe passage if they would surrender and 900 of the fighting men are buried under the marketplace of what now is called Medina. They renamed it Medina in honor of Muhammad. Um, well, uh, you can think about that. That's like giving Arafat the Nobel Peace Prize. Uh, but they did. Now, Muhammad solidified his power with about 25 murders. A number of his first victims were poets who wrote disrespectful verses. So he justified himself by a passage added to the Quran, and I won't have time to mention many of these, but Muhammad often got uh, an uh, a revelation recorded in the Quran, because he was the one that was dictating this, that justified his actions. How about that? Now, his first victims, some of them were poets uh, who wrote disrespectful verse, so what do you know? Along comes a passage in the Quran Surah 26, 221 through 224, declaring that all poets were inspired of Satan. Now, he supported himself and his new religion by attacking villages and passing caravans for booty, including slaves. An old enemy from Mecca, captured along with many others uh, in an attack on a richly laden caravan, reminded Muhammad, who was also from Mecca, well, Meccans, we don't kill our captives. Muhammad had him promptly beheaded. Well, what do you know? Along came another 
uh, verse for the Quran that said, quote, it is not for any prophet to have captives until he hath made slaughter in the land. That's Surah 8, 67. Can this be the founder of a religion of peace? I don't know. It raises some serious uh, questions. There are other alleged revelations that were added. Um, how about when Muhammad, he accidentally saw a scantily clad Zainab, the wife of his adopted son Zaid, and fell madly in love with her. Another timely revelation came along that was added to the Quran, uh, Surah 33, 35 through 38, that Zaid should divorce Zainab so Muhammad could marry her. The revelation ended thus, quote, the commandment of Allah must be fulfilled. I can cite a few other revelations that were uh, equally self-serving. Both the Hajj, now everybody knows what the Hajj is, that's the annual pilgrimage and so forth, uh, and Ramadan, 30-day fast from sun up to sundown, and then you can uh, feast and, and so, forth, so forth the rest of the time. Uh, this, is not, this is not Islamic stuff. This was practiced by the pagan Arabs for centuries before Muhammad was born. Uh, uh, the Hajj, I mean the pagan Arabs, this is the Kaaba. It had 300 and some idols in it. The main idol was Allah. Uh, that uh, was the main idol in there. Now Muhammad smashed them all eventually, but he also went there and went circled around and joined in the worship with the pagan Arabs while there were still these idols uh, in, in the Kaaba. Uh, well, he uh, finally went to take over Mecca. He didn't have quite enough troops. This was in uh, 629 and uh, no, 628. He made a treaty with the Meccans. It's called the Treaty of Hudaybiyah, very important in Islamic history, where he actually said, and we have a copy, that he was not the prophet of Allah. And that gave him the right the following year, 629, to go and worship. He joined the pagan Arabs in their worship at the, at the Kaaba. His followers did. Uh, and then on, in 630, he took over. He had enough power, he took over, uh, and so forth. Now, the Feast of Ramadan, or the Fast of Ramadan, if you want to call it that, well, uh, Muhammad had been attacking caravans. His first three attacks failed. So, what do you know? Along came another revelation to be added to the Quran that Mu uh, Muslims, they could fight. You see, the Arabs for centuries had said, no, uh, 30 days, uh, Ramadan, we do not fight. We don't attack one another. But Allah gave Muhammad permission to attack during Ramadan. So that was his first success. It was a surprise. They were not expecting uh, that attack. And that's really launched his career. Uh, well, I better move on from that because I'm going to run out of time here. Now, there's no comparison between Jesus and Muhammad and the followers. Peter said Christ left us an example that we should follow his steps who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. But the Quran frankly admits that Muhammad was a sinner, urges him to confess his sins. And I don't um, think that we would uh, want to follow uh, some of the things that Muhammad did. The history of Islam has been shameful. His followers killing one another by the hundreds of thousands the first uh, century or two. Uh, 
uh, after after Muhammad died. They're still doing it today, you know, in Iraq, the Shi Shiites and the Sunnis, they're killing one another. Uh, a Shiite goes into a Sunni mosque, or maybe it could be in Pakistan, blows himself up, a suicide bomber, and, and the Shiites say, he went to heaven as a martyr. The Sunnis say, he went to hell. But then a Sunni goes into a Shiite mosque and blows himself up, and his uh, fellow Muslims, actually, and the Shiites say he went to hell. No, the Sunnis say he was a martyr and he went to heaven. I mean, we've got, had this thing going on for a long time now, right to the present day. You had an eight-year war between Iran and Iraq. They were Muslims fighting one another, Shiites and Sunnis. Uh, they used a thousand tons of poison gas on one another. They killed as many as in World War I. I don't think that represents a peaceful religion. You had a uh, civil war going on in, in um, Algeria. They killed more than 100,000 of one, one another. And I, I mean, I could go on. The history of Islam has been the history of slaughter. They went all the way from France to China. Most of you didn't know that. Historians tell us that the Muslims in India alone slaughtered more than Hitler slaughtered in East and, and, and West uh, Europe and North Africa. Uh, so I'm just simply, I think it's legitimate. What has Islam done? It seems to me that it has been responsible for murdering millions millions of people. Now, I don't think that the followers of Jesus did that. Now, there are some people who call themselves the followers of Jesus. But what I'm talking about is the example Muhammad himself set, what the Quran says. There are more than 100 verses in the Quran of, uh, of is, uh, jihad uh, in, in the name of Allah. Uh, let's take a, another comparison here. The Bible says, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Well, try that out in Saudi Arabia. There is no liberty, and no liberty in, in, in any real Muslim country where, they, where the Muslims have any control. Saudi Arabia, a Jew can't set foot in there, and they wouldn't, be, wouldn't dare because they would be killed the minute they set foot in there. Muhammad said, Allah has commanded me. Uh, no, that's uh, Allah, uh, he said the last day, Muhammad said the last day will not come until the Muslims confront the Jews and the Muslims destroy them. In that day, Allah will give a voice to the rocks and the trees and they will cry out, O Muslim, O Abdullah, O servant of Allah, there is a Jew hiding behind me. Come and kill him. Um, this is from the Sahih Bukhari Hadith. Uh, there is, you, you, not only can a Jew enter Saudi Arabia, uh, I couldn't carry a Bible on the street in Saudi Arabia. Um, Shabir and I could not have this debate in Saudi Arabia. I was speaking on Islam in a, a, a church and the whole front row was the Imam and we want to speak too. Well, I said, when you can work that out in Saudi Arabia, or a Muslim country, then we'll do it. Why don't you have that freedom that we give you here? Why don't you have it over there? That's a question that maybe uh, Shamir could answer for us. Well, any Muslim who changes, converts to any other religion, off with his head, and they do it in Saudi Arabia, and I document all of these things for you, in this book, uh, Judgment Day. We're still considering the fruits. A tsunami uh, strikes. Um, thousands, maybe millions of Muslims are killed. Who rushes to their aid? The West, Western nations. Now, I would say that's a Christian heritage, not that the West really practices Christianity now, because they've strayed from that, but there is still an ethic and a morality that hangs on from the Christianity that once they had. Muslim nations, with their trillions in, in oil revenues, they don't do very much. It's the West, 
that always r rushes to do this. You can dispute that or look it up if, if you wish. Now, how do the Bible and the Quran uh, compare? Well, the 66 books in the Bible are inspired over a period of more than 1,500 years through 40 different prophets, most of whom never knew one another. But they, there's a continuous developing revelation. Hundreds of times the prophets declare, hundreds of times. Uh, Ezekiel, more than 60 times himself, the word of the Lord came unto me saying. Muhammad never says that. Uh, the Quran never says that. Muhammad says it was uh, the angel Gabriel who was telling him what Allah said. And furthermore, the Bible is established. God doesn't change his mind. The Quran, I'm quoting Surah 2106, such of our revelations as we abrogate or cause to be forgotten, we bring in their place one better or the like. Manuscripts, we got more than about 25,000 uh, full or partial manuscripts for the New Testament. We've got all kinds of manuscripts for the Old Testament. There are no manuscripts for the Quran. The Quran, Muhammad was illiterate. Uh, he couldn't read. He recited it as um, uh, um, the angel Gabriel supposedly dictated it to him. People weren't quite ready. They wrote it down as quickly as they could on, on palm leaves or bones or rocks or whatever was at hand, and that was kind of kept by the people who wrote it there. Uh, Muhammad's favorite wife, Aisha, said domestic animals ate some of the original Quran. Now there was a caliph named Uthman, by the way, three of the first four caliphs called the rightly, divi rightly divided caliphs, they were murdered by fellow Muslims. Imagine Peter being murdered by John. Uh, no, this doesn't speak well. We're talking about the fruits again. Uh, we could contrast the less than sterling character of Muhammad with biblical prophets. Peter said, holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. But what does the Quran say? Well, it says... Uh, Muhammad lied, cheated, lusted, deceived, robbed, and killed. The Quran doesn't uh, talk about that particular part, but it does the, the previous. And often did it in the name of Allah. He had numerous wives, at least 16, decade, uh, besides concubines, four times the four wives allowed by the Quran, but he was special. He got special revelations for that and so forth. The Quran makes it clear, as I said, Muhammad was a sinner who needed forgiveness from Allah, Surah 40, uh, 55, and so forth. You got all kinds of contradictions in the Quran, contradicting the Bible and so forth, which I better skip over. Now, proof of Revelation. Well, proof of inspiration. The Bible has hundreds of prophecies, hundreds of prophecies, given thousands of years before they were fulfilled, but they were fulfilled to the letter or they are in the process of fulfilling. And I call this the primary evidence God gives because God himself says so. Isaiah uh, 46, 9 and 10, the God of the Bible says, I'll prove that I'm God by telling you what will happen before it happens. And when it happens, you will have to acknowledge I'm God and this book is my word, the Bible. There are hundreds of prophecies and I gave, I think, it's the last two debates, I gave just a, a few of them, a very few. Let me just repeat some or come up with some other ones. Um, I, I mentioned Jesus said, uh, uh, Luke 21, 24, Jerusalem will be trodden down of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. I, I, I mentioned um, uh, the, uh, the United Nations resolution 
181, which divided the land, which was another fulfillment of prophecy. Uh, Joel 3, verse 2, God says he's going to punish the world's nations for dividing this land. Never was divided before then, conquered by many nations, but a conqueror doesn't divide the land. He keeps it for himself. But the Bible very accurately said, the nations of this world are going to divide my land, the land of Israel, and I'm going to punish them, uh, punish them for it. Um, well... Jesus said, Jerusalem, Luke 21, 24, Jerusalem will be trodden down by the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. And we don't have time to talk about that. The proof of the Koran. Well, there are no prophecies. Now, uh, he may, Shabir may come up with, with some, I don't know. Hundreds of... Hundreds that you can't question that are very clear in the Bible. I don't know of any clear, let alone hundreds of them from the Koran. Uh, but the Bible prophecy is what God says will, uh, will prove that he is God. And it's about the Jews. Now, in contrast, there is not a, a biblical prophet who was uncertain they said, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, but Muhammad was very uncertain. Several times he committed, I'm sorry, he attempted suicide because he was afraid that Satan was deceiving him with these revelations from the angel Gabriel. Now, how did he, how was he delivered from this? Well, his wife, Khadijah, uh, she had a test. She said, look, sit on my lap here and uh, I will proceed to disrobe. And as she disrobed in stages, she said, do you still see the angel? Yes. Finally, when she was completely nude, she said, do you still see the angel? Muhammad said, no, he's gone. Well, then Khadija said, oh, it's an angel. It's not the devil, okay? Now, that's kind of a strange proof uh, for, for the inspiration. And I don't know, uh, does it make sense to trust a prophet who was suicidal because he thought Satan was inspiring him, who was delivered from his fears in this superstitious manner? I don't think so. Muhammad was unable to do miracles, as the Quran says, Surah 17, 90 through 96 and so forth. But um, Jesus, of course, did many miracles. The manuscripts are no manuscripts. That was finally put together by Caliph Uthman. But uh, we, I don't have time to talk about that. This is years afterwards. Muhammad, oddly enough, never said, let's get this into one book. It was a later person, and it took some time to get that done. What about the, uh, what about the uh, um, Old Testament books? Uh, well, let me quote Robert Wilson, one of the greatest scholars, uh, fluent in more than 40 Semitic languages. He spent 45 years continuously examining this talk about the Old Testament, he said, I've made that my life study. The result of those 45 years study which I've given to the text has been this. I can affirm there is not a page of the Old Testament concerning which we need have any doubt. We have manuscripts and so forth. Now, the Quran might surprise you. I'm sure that Sabir Ali, I give you all of this in Judgment Day. I'm sure he, he knows. It confirms that the Jews are the chosen people of Allah. How about that? And that he gave the promised land to them. Let me quote it for you. We made a covenant of old with the children of Israel. That's Surah 570. We brought the children of Israel across the Red Sea, and Pharaoh with his host pursued them. We verily did a lot unto the children of Israel a fixed abode. That's 1091 and 94. Pharaoh wished to scare them from the land, but we drowned him and those with him in the Red Sea altogether. We said unto the children of Israel, dwell in the land. That's Surah 17, 103, 104. We delivered the children of Israel from Pharaoh. We chose them purposely above all creatures. We favored them above all peoples. 
Remember, Allah's favor to you. He gave you what he gave to no other of his creatures. O oh, my people, the Jews, go into the Holy Land which Allah hath ordained for you. Well, there we have an agreement between the Quran and the Bible. Obviously, Allah is not, um, is not Yahweh of the Bible because he hates Jews. Right, the, the, uh, the second 40-minute offering from Shabir Ali begins now. <laughs> Hello, everyone. I'm so delighted to be with you here tonight. My thanks go to Paul McGregor for inviting me, uh, for Mr. Dave Hunt uh, for agreeing to uh, share the platform with me, and uh, for my, to my good friend Michael Corrin to be just a, a generous host here uh, tonight. I'm so delighted to be with all of you. Thank you all for coming out uh, to at least hear me, even to if, if it means to see me get defeated or crucified here tonight. The topic uh, before us uh, was, uh, and still is, Bible versus Quran, or can we say the Bible versus the Quran? And we should uh, keep our uh, eye on the topic because we're not talking about Islamic history or Christian history. We're not going to look at the history of the Crusades or the history of Muslims slaughtering each other. But we're asking what does the Bible say about the issues we want to discuss and what does the Quran say about the same issues? Uh, it is very important then uh, that we uh, think about how Muslims might view the Bible. For a Muslim, the topic is a little bit uh, ill-formed uh, uh, because for a Muslim, it's not the Bible versus the Quran. Muslims in principle believe in all of the scriptural revelations that have been revealed by God, including those that are contained within the Bible. So for me, it's not a choice that I must have the Bible and not the Quran. I would rather have both, read them both, be informed by both, be inspired by both, uh, and be all the better enlightened for reading them and understanding them both. But if I'm to uh, make a choice, if I'm forced to choose between one and the other, then uh, it, uh, the demands of tonight's debate is that I should explain my reasons uh, why I would in that case prefer the Quran over the Bible. And I hope that you will respect uh, that choice, uh, especially after seeing my reasons. I should say something about the nature of tonight's uh, debate. Obviously, there are many different approaches to Christianity. There are Anglicans, there are Catholics, uh, there are many different forms and varieties. And uh, some forms of Christianity have great respect for a pluralism, for ecumenism, and uh, for Islam in particular. The Second Vatican Council, for example, has made uh, uh, statements that are favorable towards uh, accepting Islam as one of the world faiths. And our own United Church here in Canada, in fact, has published a document entitled that we may know each other, uh, also available on their website. And in that document, in fact, uh, they have said that while they cannot uh, admit that the Prophet Muhammad, or they cannot accept that the Prophet Muhammad is the seal of the prophets, the way Muslims believe him to be, for in doing so they would have to in some way demote the gospel uh, from its primary importance as they see it, uh, they can nevertheless, uh, not only can, but would and should acknowledge that uh, Muhammad was a prophet of God, and uh, by extension that the Quran contains divine revelation also from God. I realize that uh, my friend uh, Dave takes a different approach uh, to the religion of Islam. This is evident from his books, which I have studied in some detail, especially his book Judgment Day and some others. Uh, it, it is uh, clear that he will not afford to Islam uh, anything uh, in common with Christianity, uh, which in fact is a surprising way of putting it. It seems to be a gross exaggeration to say that Islam has nothing in common with Christianity, uh, especially since he himself has stood here tonight and uh, has cited some things from the Quran which shows some areas of common ground. Uh, in a very different setting, what I would have done was to try and, and show common ground, especially when I involve myself in dialogue with uh, people who uh, are also willing uh, to explore common ground. In that case, we would not deny the fact that we have differences. They should neither be denied uh, nor ignored. Uh, we should try to explore them and understanding in academic settings so we can uh, come out all the way uh, better informed and more appreciative of each other despite our differences. But tonight's uh, uh, setting calls for me to uh, mount a capable defense uh, to the uh, presentation that uh, Mr. Hunt has uh, already put before you, uh, 
And so we'll see if I can uh, be equal uh, to the task. I should say by way of preamble that uh, when I think of the scripture of Islam, I don't think of the scripture as being the only definitive guide uh, to what God wants from us. God informs us through scripture and through reason. The fact that a scripture says something in plain words is not the be all and end all of it because God has also equipped us with a reason, with, with intellect, so that we can understand how the scripture might be applied in a given circumstance. There are things which are mentioned in the Quran which are very much uh, uh, tied to the conditions in which the Quran was uh, revealed some 1400 years ago. Some of these statements may not apply just simply to be translated uh, to our present context. One has to look at the statements, the historical context, and the present situation and ask, if God said that to them 1400 years ago, what does God mean to say to us today through the same words, given that our circumstances are different? And that leads us to say that when we're looking at scriptures, whether it is the Bible or the Quran, uh, we should, uh, in interpreting them, look at two uh, interrelated issues. Our interpretation should be intertextual. That means that we are to look at one passage of the text and ask, what does this mean in the light of other passages in the same text? We interpret a book in the light of itself. Second, our interpretation should be contextual, which means that we should be looking at not only what the text says, but also what was the socio-political uh, historical context in which that was first said. Now, looking at that then, we should ask, what about the violence that uh, uh, Dave attributes to uh, the, the scripture of Islam? Well, in fact, if one were to compare the Bible and the Quran, uh, in my own humble view, I, I do not believe that the Quran is a violent book. There are passages in the Quran which speak of violence, but there are passages in the Quran which speak about love and marriage and, and uh, kindness and generosity. There are passages of, of the Quran speaking to a wide variety of circumstances. These passages were not given all at once by a single writer, such as Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John, sitting down and writing a, a whole document from start to finish. These passages, the Quran is a collection of smaller passages that were given by revelation to the Prophet Muhammad over a period of 23 years. And over that period of 23 years, there were all sorts of things happening to Muslims and among Muslims. And these individual passages commented on those situations. Eventually, after the death of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, all of these passages were collected into the same one book, without any notation as to what was happening at the time. But one has to go outside of the Quran to find whatever good historical information does exist to place these revelations within the context of those 23 years to find out what was happening to understand what the passages are speaking about. So yes, there are passages about war. And uh, when a soldier is in the midst of a war and that soldier is told, go and kill the enemy, that seems to be the most natural thing to be said to a soldier. But the same statement taken out of the war context and placed at a hockey game would in fact be a distortion of what the original message was about. So one has to interpret the Quran in the light, of, not only of itself, but in the light of the historical context. And once that is done, it is very clear that there is nothing in the Quran that actually promotes violence. On the other hand, if one were to look at the Bible, one would see that while we have to apply the same measures, interpreting things in the uh, light of it, uh, interpreting the Bible in the light of itself, interpreting the Bible in the light of the socio-political historical context, to a large extent, the context is also mentioned in the Bible. The Bible is a very detailed book, especially the Old Testament. You know, the Quran is only about four-fifths the size of the New Testament. And compared with the Old Testament, the uh, New Testament is actually quite small. The, New Te the Old Testament, then, is quite detailed. And we can see some of the historical context described in, in the midst of the instructions that are given within the Bible. So if we were to ask, then, about God's promise to Abraham... As uh, Dave pointed out, that is mentioned in the Quran as well. God told the people of Israel to go and dwell in the land. But there's nothing in the Quran about telling the people to go in and kill everyone in the land to take it over. Yet, in the Bible, unfortunately, this is how it says. 
At at first, God promises uh, Abraham in Genesis 12 that I'm going to give you all of this land, the land land of the Hivites and Perizzites and Canaanites and so on. Ten different peoples are mentioned. So you might be thinking, okay, God must have some major evacuation plan for all of these people because he's going to give that land to Abraham and his descendants. What's going to happen to the people? Well, I don't need to cite you the verse because uh, Dave has uh, very easily and uh, and surprisingly uh, written in his book uh, Armageddon that uh, the plan was to destroy and displace those people, all the ten peoples that are mentioned. Moving on from that, uh, if we think of Moses, to Muslims, Moses in the Quran is a very peaceful prophet. He rescued the people from under the domination of the Pharaoh. It is the people of God being attacked and oppressed by the others. God's prophet comes to rescue them. God's prophet is a peaceful person. He's Moses, respected and beloved by Muslims. Numbers chapter chapter 31, however, uh, details what happens when Moses led the people on the way. They came upon the Moabites and uh, they entered into war with them. And Moses gave the people this instruction. Now, therefore... Kill every male among the little ones. That's verse number 17 from Numbers 31. And kill every woman who has known man intimately. But all the girls who have not known man intimately, spare for yourselves. Verse number 32. This booty, what was left of the loot which the soldiers had taken, amounted to 675,000 sheep, 72,000 oxen, 61,000 asses, and 32,000 girls who were still virgins. Now, in Sunday school, you know, we were all taught. I went to Sunday school as well. And, you know, we sang these songs round and round the walls of Jericho. But we were never told the whole story. Well, the whole story can be read in the pages of the Bible. Joshua chapter 6, verses number 21 and 24 tells us what happens after the walls fell. They utterly destroyed everything in the city both man and woman, young and old, and oxen, sheep, and donkey, with the edge of the sword. Joshua said to the two men who had spied out the land, go into the harlot's house, referring to Rahab, and bring uh, the woman and all she has out of there as you have sworn to her. So the young men who were spies went in and brought out Rahab and her father and her mother and her brothers and all she had. They also brought out all of her relatives and placed them outside the camp of Israel. Verse number 24, they burned the city with fire and all that was in it, only the silver and gold and articles of bronze and iron, they put into the treasury of the house of the Lord. So this was the plan. It wasn't to evacuate those people, give them another land, let them go live somewhere else and say, look, God uh, wants this land for his chosen people. It was displace and destroy in in the words of Dave. Now, David, of course, is one of the heroes of the Old Testament. And uh, of course, uh, again, uh, you know, uh, Sunday school pictures about David and about Goliath. And, you know, I like to make slingshots uh, because we thought, you know, David was so good with his slingshot. It must, must be a powerful little weapon. Nice to have one. And, uh, you know, we devised a, a nice little one that was just a little rubber band with a little paper. And we used that to tease the girls in class. But don't tell anybody I said that. <coughs> Uh, Now, of course, again, we weren't told the whole story. David knocked down the giant with the slingshot. But the rest of it, which can be read in the Bible, is that then he went and beheaded Goliath with the sword. But there's more to David than just this. David, uh, we find, uh, wanted to get uh, married to to Saul's daughter. Saul was the king. Saul says, okay, if you want to marry my daughter, bring me a hundred Philistine foreskins. So David goes out, he and his men, and they slaughter 200 Philistines and bring back the foreskins and counted them out to uh, Saul and said, okay, now give me your daughter. And so Saul gave him uh, his uh, daughter Michal uh, to be his wife. So David, of course, did better. He was apparently not uh, too hesitant at uh, slaughtering. Uh, By comparison, if one were to look at the story of David in in the Quran, the story of David in the Quran again is about a peaceful prophet who uh, recites beautiful tunes and uh, the birds sing along with him. Uh, David is very peaceful. So the Quran gives us a very peaceful image, whereas by comparison when we look at the same story, the Bible gives us an image of violence. Now Dave just spoke to us about uh, an incident which is reported about the prophet Muhammad on whom be peace that he saw uh, the, the wife of his adopted son and he became attracted to her. That is not in the Quran. 
So a Muslim may take that story or leave it. Many Muslims think that is a fictitious story. Muslims themselves came up with stories to romanticize the life of the Prophet Muhammad on whom be peace, in part to justify their own lechery sometimes. But the story itself, as they've recounted it, shows that the Prophet Muhammad did not do anything with that lady until her husband her, his, himself divorced her. The usual waiting period was over, which, so all of the formalities were done. And then the Prophet Muhammad married her, took her as his wife. So everything was up and up and all decent. In the Bible, on the other hand, we read about David. And of course, he's a man close to God. It says that he was a man after God's own heart. Uh, David uh, saw the wife of Uriah, Bathsheba, as she herself was taking a bath. Isn't that curious? Bathsheba taking a bath. Anyway, and he became attracted to her, and he sent for her. And he being the king, of course, she could not refuse. She went to his palace, and she conceived. Now, what was to be done? Because eventually Uriah will come back and find out that his wife got pregnant while he was out in battle. So David sent for Uriah to be brought back in. And David said, okay, go home, you know, take a break and so on, hoping that this man will go home and uh, have uh, intercourse with his wife. And so when he discovers that his wife is pregnant, he will think, ah, that was when I came back home for a vacation. But this man, being faithful to the king and faithful to the, to the country, said, I'm not going to go home. I cannot go home while my comrades are out in the battlefield. I must go back and fight there. So the man went back. But David sent a letter with him sealed, instructing the general to place this man in the front lines and to all fall back from him so that the enemy will kill him. And this was done. So we have two different images of David. One in the Quran, one in the Bible. In the Quran, he is a peaceful person, you know, singing tunes in, in the Bible. He's quite violent. We can see that there are two different books here, and I wish I didn't have to bring this up, but uh, Dave has, in a way, cornered me into this. Uh, having read his books and thought about what might be appropriate as a response, it, it seemed to me that this is the way it, it had to go. Um, and forgive me if I, if I indulge in any excesses here. I'll hear from your questions and so on and your responses. I'll know what I've done right and, and what I've done wrong. But let's read about Samson. He was another favorite in Sunday school. Samson, strong guy, long hair, and the strength is in his hair. Judges chapter 16 tells us about Samson. Um, actually, it turns out that Samson is the first suicide killer, and the only one we know of in, in the scriptures, actually. Uh, Judges 16, verse 27, tells us about Samson when he had been blinded by the enemy. There, were, there had been many altercations between him and the Philistines. Sometimes he killed many of them. Sometimes they killed his men. He, at one time, he took uh, 300 foxes. He tied their tails together, light, lit fire to their tails, and, uh, and sent them roaming into the cornfields, demolishing all of the crops, and, of course, burning the foxes as well. So where are the animal rights activists? Uh, but when Samson was eventually captured by the enemy after Delilah revealed his secret, uh, and he is brought into uh, the uh, festivities to uh, perform for the crowd, uh, this is what Samson did. Judges 16, verse 27. Now the house was full of men and women, and all the lords of the Philistines were there, and about 3,000 men and women were on the roof looking on while Samson was amusing them. Verse 28, then Samson called to the Lord and said, O Lord God, please remember me and please strengthen me just this time. O God, that I may at once be avenged of the Philistines for my two eyes. Samson grasped the two middle pillars on which the house rested and braced himself against them, with the one with his right hand and the other with his left. And Samson said, let me die with the Philistines. And he bent with all his might so that the house fell on the Lord's. And all the people who were in it, so the dead whom he killed at his death, were more than those who killed those whom he killed in his life. So we don't know the total number of those killed, but there were three thousand just on the roof alone. That means those on the roof alone were more than the people who died in the 9/11 uh, terrorist bombings, which we should all reject and denounce. But we should uh, at least be clear that uh, there is nothing in the Quran that justifies the events of uh, September 11, 2001. But we have something in the Bible which actually celebrates and glorifies a suicide killer. Samson, whom we learned to love in, in Sunday school. Uh, 
Elijah was a great prophet, a worker of uh, miracles, and John the Baptist was the second coming of Elijah. So he was not uh, a, a simple person, uh, one of great uh, history and fame. Uh, talk about religious tolerance. Well, Elijah had a contest with the priests of Baal. There were 450 prophets of Baal, and Elijah had this contest to, to see whose sacrifices will be demolished or, or devoured by God. So God accepts Elijah's sacrifice. Now it is very clear. Elijah is absolutely right. The prophets are absolutely wrong. And what does Elijah do? First, First Kings chapter 18 verse 40. Just then Elijah said, grab the prophets of Baal. Don't let any of them get away. So the people captured the prophets and took them to the Kishon River where Elijah killed every one of them. 450 prophets. Defenseless. There were prophets. Elisha. Elisha was the successor of Elijah and all of the spirit of God that was there with Elijah was actually conferred onto Elisha. Elisha was actually a great worker of miracles. Some of the miracles that are attributed to Jesus in the New Testament are somewhat in some small way rivaled by Elisha because Elisha also raised a dead person back to life. 2 Kings chapter 2 verses 23 to 24. Again thinking about religious tolerance. We heard about no freedom in Saudi Arabia. Well, yes, of course, that is a problem. And Muslims shouldn't agree with that. We, we should actually promote freedom and democracy. That, to me, uh, uh, is in line with Quranic teaching. And what they do in Saudi Arabia, I don't need to defend. Uh, there are, just as Dave was saying, there are good Christians and bad Christians. Uh, well, there are good Muslims and bad Muslims. There are people who follow the true teachings and people who do not. And uh, it is interesting that Dave, uh, in, in speaking about Muslim activities, uh, would blame all of the activities of Muslims on the Quran, but then in speaking of the, uh, the, the fact, as he has documented in his own book, that Christians slaughtered so many Jews and fellow Christians and so on, he says, okay, those are not real Christians. Okay, so then let's be fair and do it the same way for both books. But then, if we are to read the scriptures, and notice that so far I'm just simply reading the scriptures. Uh, Dave had uh, actually uh, put before us uh, the plan that uh, we're not to cite scholars because, of course, the scholars are not dependable. And then immediately after having said that, he was conscious of the need to break his own rule, and he said that. And then if one listens carefully, one would see that throughout his speech, he actually continued to break his rule, even up to the end when he cited, I believe it was Paul, what was it, Wilson? What scholar that you cited, Dave? What was his name? Robert Wilson, Yes. Yes, toward, even up to the, towards the end of your speech. So it is clear then that uh, to, uh, to, to say one thing and, and, and announce it as an ideal is easy, but then to follow it might be actually very difficult. Well then, what does the Bible say that Elisha did? And we were looking at uh, 2 Kings chapter 2, verses 23 to 24. And uh, Elisha went up from thence unto Bethel. And as he was going up by the way, there came forth little children out of the city and mocked him and said to him, Go up, thou bald head. Sorry, no offense meant to all you guys here. I know you all got here. No offense, Mike. <clears throat> so he, he was going up to Bethel, and these uh, little children come out mocking him and saying, Go up, thou bald head. Go up, thou bald head. And he turned back and looked on them and cursed them in the name of the Lord. And there came forth two she-bears out of the wood and tear Forty and two children of them tore up 42 children. It looks like God was in cooperation with Elijah to send the bears to, to maul these 32, how many were them? 42 children. It doesn't look very good. Of course, many Christians realize that again, I said, let's look at the texts intertextually but also contextually. As Dave said, these texts were written by many people over a long stretch of time. How do we know what beliefs they had, what uh, attitudes they had, how they grew up, what kinds of experiences they, they had? It is clear that Dave and I have two different experiences. And I can respect Dave, even though I disagree with what he says, because I, uh, I can well imagine that if I had a similar set of life experiences as Dave had, I might have said the same things tonight that he said. And, and if we have that understanding, then we can appreciate and respect each other even though we have differences. But we should also be aware that the biblical writers, some of them writing uh, a thousand, two thousand years ago, 
not a thousand, definitely 2,000 years ago, they had a different set of experiences, and they wrote according to these experiences that they had. Some of them inspired, were inspired by God, they felt the power of God moving in them and inspiring them to write, and this is what they wrote. But that does not mean that this is definitive for what we are going to practice today. And most Christians have the better sense to not follow the passages the way they are described here. Uh, we can rise above that. But that is my point. Whether it is the Quran or the Bible, we must re recognize that there are certain passages which uh, have more to do with the time uh, than they have uh, to do with our present times. And uh, we should uh, note the difference and, and apply the passages accordingly. Women. One of the things that uh, the Quran is being accused of uh, in modern times is being anti-women. And the implication seems to be that, look, we have another book, the Bible, which is actually very good for women, and so we should reject the Quran and choose the Bible. Actually, my experience is quite the opposite. If one were to look, for example, at the story of uh, Eve uh, in the Quran and in the Bible, one will see that in the Quran, Eve is not blamed anywhere for the sin of Adam. In fact, Adam is specifically blamed. And they're both said to have been, in a way, uh, uh, deceived by the devil. They're, they're, they're caused to, rather not, not both deceived, the devil caused both of them to slip from the garden in which they had their security. Uh, but the one who is singled out for blame in the Quran is Adam. In chapter 20, verse number 119, 120, it says, فَعَصَى Adam رَبَّهُ Adam disobeyed his Lord. Of course, the story in the Quran is not one about original sin, but about original forgiveness, about an original lesson. The Quranic story tells us basically that when you sin, if you turn back to God, God will forgive you as he forgave our first parents. But in the Bible, of course, we know from Genesis chapter 3 that the woman was blamed. And Adam's fault was that he listened to his wife and took the fruit and ate it from her. And that is followed through in the New Testament, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses number 3 to 10. Uh, so let, let me start with verse number 11. A woman must quietly receive instruction with entire submissiveness, but I do not allow a woman to teach or... Exp actually, I've, hold on, I've mixed up my quotes here. So uh, this is actually 1 Timothy Chapter 2, verse 11. A woman must quietly receive instruction with entire submissiveness, but I do not allow a woman to teach or exercise authority over a man, but to remain quiet. For it was Adam who was first created, and then Eve. And it was not Adam who was deceived, but the woman, being deceived, fell into transgression. But women will be preserved through the bearing of children if they continue in faith and love and sanctity with uh, self-restraint. 1 Timothy chapter 2, uh, verses number 11, uh, forward. Um, I find that text a little bit puzzling because I thought the, the general plan was that everybody gets saved by the, the fact that Jesus died for our sins. It seems that this passage is pointing out that women have a very different plan of salvation. Women will be saved through childbearing. But what is e equally uh, troubling is uh, the, the idea that the man was not deceived. It was the woman who was deceived. And when we think back about the Samson story, it was Delilah who betrays him. And one, when one thinks back about all of the stories in the Bible, one finds that Sarah and Delilah, and it looks like women are always being painted in a bad light in the Bible, or we should we say mostly painted in a bad light. We must ask why this is so. But I, I found it uh, uh, equally disturbing that uh, Dave actually cited this passage with great ease. He has no problem with saying that it wasn't the man who was deceived, it was the woman who was deceived. And of course, women have been blamed for all of the ills uh, of uh, men. Somebody said that's why they're called uh, women, you know, woe, woe to men. Anyway, that's... Uh, <laughs> Now, what is the reason for the women's covering? In, in the Islamic faith, the Quran says that uh, the women uh, should uh, draw a, a part of their outer garments over themselves. That's in chapter 33 of the Quran. So that they should be known and, and not molested. It seems that from, from the context of that passage, there were hypocrites in Medina, the city of the Prophet, who were harassing the women. And when they were asked about that, they were giving some excuses. They were saying, we didn't know these were our women and so on. So the Quran was just simply advising the women that if they were to uh, gather the garments in a particular way, they would be recognized in that society as decent, upright women, 
ones who would not mess around, and that would rob the hypocrites of the one excuse which they had. On the other hand, the Quran promised the hypocrites, or rather threatened them, that if they do not st stop their ill behavior, they will be driven out from the area. So the purpose of the woman's head covering seems to be then that she guards herself from being molested by people who might be looking out for uh, a quick uh, encounter. What is the purpose in the Bible then for a head cover? 1 Corinthians chapter 3 verse numbers 10 to uh, verses number 3 to 10. That's where I began, and here are the verses now. Paul writes and says, But I want you to understand that Christ is the head of every woman, and the man is the head of a woman, and God is the head of Christ. Every man who has something on his head while praying or prophesying disgraces his head, but every woman who has her head uncovered while praying or prophesying disgraces her head. For she is one and the same as the woman whose head is shaved. For if a woman does not cover her head, let her also have her hair cut off. But if it is disgraceful for a woman to have her hair cut off or her head shaved, let her cover her head. For a man ought not to have his head covered since he is the image and glory of God. But the woman is the glory of man. For man does not originate for, from woman, but woman from man. For indeed, man was not created for the woman's sake, but woman for the man's sake. Therefore, the woman ought to have a symbol of authority on her head because of the angels. So you, you can see the symbolism and imagery here. A woman must have a sign of authority on her head. The, a, a woman wearing her, her headscarf following this passage should be doing so to show that she is subordinate. Somebody is above her. Uh, the man is above her, and of course above the man is Christ. So there's a hierarchy of beings, and the woman is actually way down below. You have God and Christ and man and then woman. So it's a different sort of imagery here. If one says that the Quran demeans women and the Bible praises uh, women or puts them in a much better light, uh, I think one has to think again because the reality is actually the opposite if one were to really be familiar with most scriptures. Of course we're not so familiar with these scriptures because who bothers anymore? Most of us have the better sense to realize that Paul here is writing at a time when he could think in this way. And we don't think in that way anymore. Again, we think that's the Bible, that's what it said at one time. But God has given us intelligence to think, to reason, and uh, we are informed both by the reason and the scripture. Now, it turns out that uh, according to the Bible, a man could sell his daughter as a slave. Exodus chapter 21, verse number 7 says, If a man sells his daughter as a female slave, she is not to go free as the male slaves do. I don't have time to elaborate on that, but I think that's enough. Now, there is a way that uh, a man might be required to prove that his daughter was a virgin at the time when she got married. Deuteronomy chapter 22, verses number 15 and forward. Recently, we got all hyped up about the Aksa Parve's uh, murder, and we're wondering, what does that have to do with Islam? And some people are thinking, well, yeah, that's Islam's teaching. You know, honor killings all over the Muslim world. What are Muslims doing? They're following the Quran. They're not following the Quran. The Quran, in fact, prohibits Muslims from taking innocent life. And uh, taking a life for what people call honor killing is actually a dishonorable murder, for as far as I can understand from the Quran. But we can see that in the Bible, there is some hint of... Uh, something that we might call honor killing. Just listen. Deuteronomy chapter 22, verses number 15 forward. Then the girl's father and her mother shall take and bring out the evidence of the girl's virginity to the elders of the city at the gate. I should preface that by saying that's in case her husband says, when I married her, she wasn't a virgin. The girl's father shall say to the elder, so apparently the father saves uh, some of her garments from the wedding night, uh, perhaps stained with uh, uh, material that will show that she was a virgin at the time. So now he parades it before the elders of the city to prove that his daughter was a virgin. The girl's father shall say to the elders, I gave my daughter to this man for a wife, but he turned against her. And behold, he has charged her with shameful deeds, saying, I did not find your daughter a virgin, but this is the evidence of my daughter's virginity. Imagine how shameful that must be for the girl. And they said, they shall spread the garment before the elders of the city. So the elders of that city shall take the man and chastise him and they shall fine him a hundred shekels of silver and give it to the girl's father because he publicly defamed the virgin of Israel and she shall remain his wife. He cannot divorce her all his, all his days. But if this charge is true, that the girl was not found a virgin, then they shall bring out the girl to the doorway of her father's house and the men of her city shall stone her to death. Because she has committed an act of folly in Israel by playing the harlot in her father's house. Thus, 
you shall purge the evil from among you. You see, why is she brought to her father's house to receive her death penalty? Because this is how you purge the evil. Because she has defiled her father's house, and now the name of the family must be cleared. And the same thing goes, or slightly differently, for a priest's daughter. Leviticus chapter 21, verse number 9. Suppose a priest's daughter makes herself unclean by becoming a prostitute. Then she brings shame on her father. She must be burned to death. Why? You see what's happening? She brings shame to her father. You can understand that around the Mediterranean basin in ancient times, this was a very common way of viewing things. You bring shame to me, I uh, eradicate myself from that, uh, I eradicate that shame by putting an end to it in a very decisive way. A poor girl is, uh, is killed. Jephthah. Jephthah. I don't know how many of you know, know Jephthah. We didn't learn much about him in Sunday school. Uh, in Judges chapter 11, uh, then the Lord's spirit took control of Jephthah, and Jephthah went through Gilead and Manasseh, raising an army. Finally, he arrived at Mitzpah in Gilead, where he promised the Lord, if you let me defeat the Ammonites and come home safely, I will sacrifice to you whatever comes, or whoever, rather, whoever comes out to meet me first. Then eventually he gets home because he's destroyed all of these armies by the help of God. And when Jephthah returned to his home, this is verse number 34 in Mitzpah, the first one to meet him was his daughter. She was playing a tambourine and dancing to celebrate his victory, and she was his only child. Oh, Jephthah cried. Then he tore his clothes in sorrow and said to his daughter, I made a sacred promise to the Lord, and I must keep it. Your coming out to meet me has broken my heart. Father, she said, you made a sacred promise to the Lord, and he let you defeat the Ammonites. Now you must do what you promised, even if it means I must die. But first, let me spend two months wandering in the hill country with my friends. We'll cry together, because I can never get married and have children. Yes, you may have two months, Jephthah said. She and some other girls left, and for two months they wandered in the hill country crying because she could never get married and have children. Then she went back to her father. He did what he had promised, and she never got married. What a nice way of saying it. And she never got married. Of course she never got married. That's why every year, uh, Israelite girls walk around for four days weeping for Jephthah's daughter. So we can see then that in, in short, there is something about honor killings actually in, in the Bible. Clearer than this is Deuteronomy chapter 13, which speaks about an apostate in your own house. If one of your family commits apostasy, what are you to do? You are to be the first ones to stone the apostate in your own family. So honor killings is very old. It predates the religion of Islam. It's not condoned by the Quran. But uh, we can see that in fact, uh, I don't know what they called it back then, but it looks like the th kinds of things I'm looking at in the Bible right now uh, is similar to what we are referring to as honor killings in our present time. So you see a lot of times people uh, misunderstand, they blame the Quran for something that it does not represent and Muslims of course might be better followers of the Bible than they are of the, uh, of the Quran. But you know, I, I don't want to commit any excesses here. I only prepared this to, to meet uh, Dave on his own ground because I've read his books and I've seen the kinds of approaches that he takes. What is the punishment for rape? It is clear from the Quran that uh, uh, hiraba or highway robbery or attacking a person is punishable, but rape is not specifically mentioned in the Quran either. Either way, it's just not uh, mentioned. And one might see that uh, as, as a defect. One might say, okay, well, why doesn't it mention rape? It is a very common thing. I, I don't know why. This is the word of God, but Muslims uh, develop the Islamic law in, in ways that will try to enact justice. And, of course, we use our reason in addition to the scripture. Rape is wrong, we punish it. Deuteronomy chapter 22, verses number 22 on forward, talks about what should happen in the case of rape. If a girl is attacked and uh, she is uh, not married, she is single, then uh, obviously she doesn't belong to anyone. So the penalty is that uh, this, uh, the attacker is to pay her 50 shekels and take her to be his wife, and he's not allowed to divorce her for as long as he lives. So if one were to survey the result, it's uh, quite obvious that the girl gets raped, her father gets the money, the rapist gets the girl, and the girl gets to live with her rapist for the rest of her life. He had better watch out he doesn't get poisoned or something. Well... 
In short, I must uh, wrap this up by saying that the Quran and the Bible are two books with both, which both contain excellent teachings from God. I want to have them both. I want to read the Quran in the light of the Bible, the Bible in the light of the Quran. I want to benefit from all of the wisdom that is there between these books. I, I had not had a chance to, tonight to elaborate on what I find to be some of the most beautiful passages of the Bible, some moving, very interesting and motivating passages, passages which teach us about kindness, about love. Uh, some of these passages are very striking. Who can deny the truth of Jesus' uh, Sermon on the Mount, for example, about blessed are the poor, and so on. I, I love those passages. I'd like to have both books, the Bible and the Quran. But if one forces me to choose between the Bible and the Quran, I would say I would choose the Quran, and I have mentioned some of my reasons here tonight. The Quran, to me, guides us to that which is just and right, against violence, and towards equitable treatment towards women. Thank you. Okay, well, uh, Shabir is a tough debater, uh, and he does an excellent job. Uh, and uh, uh, he said that um, history uh, isn't really that important. I, I shouldn't be getting into history. I think it is, because that's the fruit of what is produced. Uh, and um, some of the th things, that the examples that he gave, uh, man sacrificing his daughter who comes out to meet him and so forth, that was not condoned by God. That was not anything that God inspired him to do. Uh, now, he paints a picture that the Koran is really a milder book uh, than the, um, the Bible. God gives specific reasons. Uh, he doesn't say, kill everybody, uh, take over the world. Muhammad says, Allah has commanded me to fight against all people until all people confess there's no God but Allah and Muhammad is his prophet. Now, he's not going to take responsibility for what goes on in Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia is where it all began. Uh, this is where the Kaaba is. This is where Medina is. These are the two holiest sites for Muslims. And I would assume that this is where they really practice Islam as it should be practiced. Uh, and uh, it's not a pretty picture. I document in Judgment Day uh, how many they behead. You know, uh, you change your faith off with your head and they take it off in chop chop square and they announce it in the newspapers radio and so forth and people come to cheer this on i don't read of anybody saying no that's not what the uh, quran commands uh, or the hadith i was citing from the sahih bukhari hadith which i think is uh, pretty official uh, with islam uh, he says we ought to have both of them, uh, respect both of them, but there are very serious contradictions between Islam and, and Christianity, between uh, the Bible and the Quran. Now, God told Moses, I'm sorry, uh, God told um, uh, the children of Israel to there was a particular land that uh, he had given them. Moses never got into that land. It was called the land of Canaan. Uh, we have a real uh, problem in, in um, Israel today. I call it the land of Israel because that's the name. Uh, we have a people who call themselves Palestinians. Uh, and they say that they are the original Palestinians. They're descended from the original Palestinians because they're Arabs and uh, the first son of, of uh, uh, Abraham was Ishmael and they're descended from Ishmael. Now we got a little problem. I mean, there are a lot of things. Uh, uh, I will agree with um, my friend over here. There is too much to discuss. He laid out an awful lot for me and I'm not going to be able to answer every point that he makes. But 
We have a very serious problem in the Middle East now. We have a people who call themselves Palestinians, claim to be descended from the original Palestinians. That's rather strange because they claim to be descended from uh, Ishmael. Well, Ishmael was the first son of Abraham. But who was his father and who was his mother? Well, Ishmael's father was an Iraqi. He was a Chaldean. And his mother was an Egyptian. So now you have an Iraqi father and an Egyptian mother. And they come to a land called Canaan. It wasn't called Palestine. And it has already been settled by Canaanites. And you say you're descended from the original Palestinians? You're not even descended from the original Canaanites. There was no Palestine at that time. So we have a false claim uh, that uh, apparently is accepted by the world, unfortunately, and that becomes the basis for violence. Now, what about the destruction of these people? Well, I think I mentioned it this afternoon or last night. Uh, if we went to Genesis 15, God says to Abraham, I am going to give your descendants this land, but I cannot give it to them now because the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. And the Canaanites are not as wicked as they are going to be. They're not evil enough for me to be justified in wiping them out. Now, I can't second guess the Bible and say, well, I wonder what they could have done to be worthy of, of being wiped out men, women, and children, but apparently God had his reasons as he had with Sodom and Gomorrah. Uh, he wiped them out. Uh, I believe that God is just, and there must have been some very serious reasons. But God did not say to the Jews, take over the world. But Muhammad says, Allah has commanded me to fight against all people until all people confess there's no God but Allah and Muhammad is his prophet. Uh, so there is a bit of a difference. Furthermore, that was a specific land, the land of Canaan. It had boundaries. It had certain nations living there which are named. He didn't say take over, come to America and take over America. Uh, he didn't uh, say take over all of North Africa and go all the way to China and kill more people in India than Hitler killed, you know. Uh, no, but the Muslims did that. They took over all of the, had the fastest spreading and the largest uh, empire. I don't think it was self-defense that caused them to go to China or up into uh, uh, France and so forth. They had the definite intention. They felt they were obeying. They were obeying God, obeying Allah in doing this. Uh, let me just uh, uh, quote from an uh, editorial that was in <clears throat> uh, Al Hayat Al Jadida. This is September 11th, 2001. This is a few, it's from the east. This is from so called Palestine. It's from the east. And what does it say? Al Hayat Al Jadida states the suicide bombers of today are the noble successors of the Lebanese suicide bombers who taught the U.S. Marines a tough lesson in Lebanon. They killed 243 and so forth. These suicide bombers are the salt of the earth, the engines of history, the most honorable people among us for killing innocent women and children. Uh, well, I don't think... Uh, <laughs> What are they? I mean, they're going to do this everywhere. We are concerned that they could be doing this in, in our shopping centers in America. Uh, why not? This is terrorism. We're going to terrify you. You either submit to Allah or or else. Um, when the twin towers went down, these were not fanatics. These were Muslims by the thousands shouting Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. Allah is the greatest. Allah is the greatest. We know that the 19 uh, pilots who flew these planes, uh, the FBI has the records. They've now traced their steps and so forth. We know the religious rituals they went through of bathing and so forth, Islamic rituals. We know that they did it all in the name of Allah. Well, 
did Allah tell them that they should uh, kill people all over the world? Well, apparently, this is the way Muhammad uh, understood it. Uh, so, it, there, we have to make some, as, as Shabir said, we have to have some distinction. Uh, but it was only after the, the inhabitants of Canaan became so evil that God could not tolerate them. Uh, this was his opinion of Sodom and Gomorrah. Now you can disagree with God's opinion, okay. But God apparently uh, required this for specific reasons that uh, he felt were just. But he didn't tell them to take over everybody and go out and, and randomly just jump on a bus of school children in Israel and blow them all up. And yet, I don't read of, of any, I mean, uh, uh, Shabir says, that's not what you're supposed to do. But I didn't hear of any imams rising up. I didn't hear of any uh, uh, Islamic leaders in Egypt, the Al-Azhar uh, uh, um, uh, University in, in Saudi Arabia. Uh, I didn't hear them rising up and saying you shouldn't do that. Uh, let me see if I can find a quotation from the Imam uh, of the mosque in Saudi Arabia. Maybe I cannot because I don't really have time for this. This man is very tough. He's going to cut me right off. Uh, but uh, you can prove that it's not just fanatics. It's this is what Islam really teaches. At least the people think that, and the imams teach it. Uh, and this is what is practiced. Uh, so we, we've got some uh, discriminating to do. Now, David was rebuked by Nathan the prophet for what he did, and some of the things that um, uh, he, he cited, uh, God rebuked them. Uh, for that. Um, but now, what does Allah do about this? Well, in the Quran, he is merciful to whom he wants to be merciful to, uh, and he does it without any, there's no payment of a penalty. Uh, well, if you're sorry and you repent, we'll forgive you uh, now. Um, I don't think that works. I don't believe, of course, that's not the way the Bible says it. The Bible says the penalty must be paid. Uh, if you have a judge sitting on a bench and the accused stands before him, whoever he is, he's been found guilty by the court, by the jury of serious crimes, murder and so forth. And the judge says, well, I'm a merciful judge and I'll let you off this time. No, we would put him in prison as well. He is breaking the law. He has become a partner in the crime of this man. And this is what the Bible says, the penalty must be paid. It's an infinite penalty, to, in, in, uh, eternal separation from God. And only God himself can pay that penalty. And that was why God himself came to this earth and became a man, didn't cease to be God, so that he could bear the penalty for our sins. Now, I, I wish we had time to get into hell. Um, the Quran has an awful lot to say about hell. Uh, there are misunderstandings among Christians about hell. Some people think it's like God is turning you on a spit uh, just to torture you. I don't believe in that. But the Quran says God will, uh, when your skin is burned up, he'll give you another skin. Uh, so the torment can go on. I don't think that kind of torment uh, will morally affect a person. It can only add to your hatred uh, against God. I believe that the Bible says, I believe the fire of God's judgment is his holiness, his righteousness, and that the sinner realizes for the first time he's naked before God, the horror of his sin, what it really means to rebel against the God of creation. It's not just eating a, um, a piece of fruit. But this is rebellion against the Creator, and he cannot tolerate rebellion. And if he just said to Adam and Eve, well, that's okay, uh, I'll let you go this time, you know what would happen? They would do it again, maybe worse the next time. God laid down a law 
the soul that sinneth, it must die. In my universe, you're going to do what I'm going to run this universe. You're not going to run the universe, and I'm not going to tolerate rebellion. I think that's only common sense, and I think it's only just. So the God of the Bible says there is it's very serious matter to rebel against the Creator. And there must be a serious penalty. You are thrown out. You're thrown out not only out of the garden, you're thrown out of the universe. You'll be separated from God, the giver of life and the, the source of all love. You want yourself. Uh, you want your own way. You could have it. Uh, I'm not going to force anything on you, God says. And that would be the foundation, the basis for the eternal punishment that I believe the Bible teaches. It would be the foundation for the punishment of sin uh, in, in, in the Bible. And I don't think that just saying, okay, I'm merciful, you're forgiven, I don't think that's going to work. Shabir, 15 minutes to respond. Well, uh, Dave uh, gave me a compliment, but I think the compliment uh, really belongs to him. He is a formidable uh, a defender of the Christian faith and uh, a very capable debater, and that sh shows through tonight. I think if I have one little advantage, it's uh, perhaps a little bit of youthfulness, not that much, and perhaps a little bit more energy because it's understandable Dave had been at it uh, since uh, yesterday, I understand, with a number of debates here. Uh, so I appreciate. Uh, one has to, in evaluating the debate, uh, make adjustments uh, for this uh, Im imbalance. But uh, what uh, finally really matters uh, is... Uh, uh, an evaluation of the points that were raised. Not so much about the eloquence of the speaker or the power of his voice or, or any of that, but uh, to look at the actual questions that were raised and how they were addressed by the two sides. Now, uh, Dave just uh, said that Jephthah was not uh, approved by, by God, uh, and uh, and neither was uh, David, because David was rebuked by Nathan. And he's correct about David, uh, at least in the incident with Bathsheba. Yes, uh, David was rebuked for that, and the, and the child was killed, which seems weird, because to kill the child means you're punishing Bathsheba twice. First, she lost her husband in the battle. For, to begin with, she was, in fact, uh, taken advantage of by the king. Second, her, her husband is made to die. And third, her, her son, which is flesh of her own flesh, now is, uh, is killed as a punishment to David, but nobody bothers about, what about the woman? How does she feel about all of this? But I don't think he's right about Jephthah, because I don't know of any place in the Bible which, where Jephthah is actually rebuked. In the passage I read before you, Jephthah was actually uh, working with the Lord's approval. The Lord was helping him to conquer all of these people, the Ammonites and so on, and that was clear from the daughter, uh, daughter's uh, speech. Uh, what is interesting, though, is that in the book of Hebrews, in chapter uh, 11, I just looked it up, in verse number 32, it says, What more shall I say? I have no time to tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, of David and Samuel, and the prophets, who by faith conquered kingdoms, did what was righteous, obtained the promises, and so on and so forth. So these persons are actually approved in, in, the, in the Bible, Jephthah and all. Now, it is interesting that Dave continues to avoid the topic that we're discussing and he cites other sources. Our topic is the Bible versus the Quran. So we should cite these two sources and see what they say. He cited, for example, Sahih al-Bukhari. In the last 15 minutes, he's gone on and on about that, but about the Prophet uh, Muhammad saying, I have been commanded to fight people until they say that there is no God but God. But in fact, that hadith is not Quran. It is something outside of the Quran and I believe that that is not an authentic saying, especially since it contradicts many passages in the Quran. Many passages say there is no compulsion in religion. Surah 2, verse 256, for example. Passages instruct the Prophet Muhammad, telling him he's not a supervisor over people. He cannot force people to believe. How could, on the other hand, he say that God has commanded him to fight against people until they believe? It's a contradiction. That is a contradiction between the Quran on the one hand and some other extraneous saying reported and attributed to the Prophet Muhammad. So we cannot take that, especially when our topic tonight is 
uh, the Quran. It is true that there are people who will take a saying like that, insist that the Prophet Muhammad said it, and they would preach violence, and they do that in the Muslim world. But it is also incorrect uh, to insist, as Dave has done, that uh, there's no voice saying that these things are wrong, nobody is complaining and, and denouncing 7-11. I just did that. And Dave in his own book, actually, Judgment Day, he has cited Muslim scholars who have denounced these events, such as Muqtada Khan. You remember him, Dave? Hamza Yusuf, you cited them in your book. These are scholars, in fact, of great repute, and one can go to Muqtadar Khan's uh, website, ijtihad.org, and find uh, his uh, careful analyses uh, of these problems. The Palestinian problem, actually, that Dave referred to is, you can see, created by the Bible. In fact, in Genesis 15, and I just read it because I was surprised, Dave saying that God said, I must punish the Canaanites, uh, but, but that's not what it says. God said that, that he would punish the people who would enslave the, the Israelites, and those were the Egyptians. But he took them out from under the enslavement of the Egyptians and sent them into Canaan and instructed them, according to the Bible, to go in and kill everything that breathes. So which book really is violent? And which book contributes to the Palestinian problem? From the Quranic perspective, God told them, Uskunul uh, you, you should go and dwell in the land. And that means to dwell peacefully. It doesn't say go take it over by the force of sword, killing off the inhabitants. Uh, in in uh, Dave's uh, opening uh, speech, uh, he cited Matthew chapter 23 to say that uh, uh, Jesus was blasting the rabbis. But in fact, that passage also showed that they were experts in the law and they should be consulted. And that goes against Dave's point that we shouldn't consult experts. Of course, we have to refer to experts. And Dave himself has not been able to avoid referring to experts because we don't know everything. We don't know all of the ancient languages. We don't even know some of our present languages. And uh, we don't even know everything about our own language. So what about uh, the need to cite experts. Definitely we have to cite them, but that has hardly been an issue of contention because I haven't been citing experts tonight. I've just simply been referring to the pages of, of the Bible, quoting you chapter and verses. You notice that he quoted Ali Dashti about a certain scribe who said that he was changing things to suit himself in the Quran and that Muhammad killed that scribe. But the best information we have about that scribe is that in fact he, after reneging from Islam, came back into the Muslim faith and he survived the Prophet Muhammad. So to say that the Prophet Muhammad killed him, that's incorrect. And to cite Ali Dashti about this is to cite a non-scholar as far as I'm concerned. I have no reason for believing that Ali Dashti has expertise in these matters matters, especially since we have historical information about this particular scribe. Now, is Islam utterly anti-Christian? I, I don't think so. In fact, Islam, uh, to, as I understand it, promotes belief in Christ. The Muslim view, and the view that emerges from the Quran, is that uh, we are not to believe in, in, an, in a different Christ than the original historical Christ, but that is precisely what has happened over the years, over the centuries. The Quran is trying to restore that belief in the original, the real Jesus. And that is before Jesus came to be interpreted through many layers of tradition. If one were to then look past the layers of tradition in the Gospels, one would find that Jesus, as he appears in the Gospel according to Mark, for example, he's a human being, a prophet. He doesn't know when the Day of Judgment will occur, for example, Mark chapter 13, verse 32. But later on, people made him into God. In the Council of Nicaea 325, they decided that Jesus is very God of very God. That process of, uh, of development of the Christian faith is already evident in the Gospels. If one compares Mark's Gospel with John's Gospel, you will see that John's Gospel is much different. John's Gospel elevates Jesus beyond the way in which Jesus appeared in Mark's Gospel. You can see that the trend had already been set into place. The Quran is actually just simply calling us back to believing in the original Jesus before even the Gospels as we have them now were written. And so if one were to look very carefully at some of the passages that Dave cited, one will see that a different picture emerges. For example, the second Psalm, verse number seven, saying about the son, that was initially spoken about David. It meant that David is the son of God. And it is only later on that we're taking that out of its historical context. Remember, we spoke about the context. And now making that apply somehow to Jesus. But it's interesting that verse 12 says, kiss the son lest he be angry. And it turns out that what is being interpreted here is really a violent Jesus in the undertones. On the surface, we say Jesus is the Prince of Peace. But we quote passages which show that he was 
or there is some violence which is yet to come out. We haven't seen it yet. We've only seen some of it. For example, Isaiah chapter 9. A child is born, a king, a son is given. On him will rest the government on his shoulders. So what will happen? He will sit at the right hand of God till God makes his enemies his footstool, according to Psalm 110. If this is interpreted in, as a reference to Jesus, it means that Jesus will conquer his enemies. Who wants to be a king and, and have his enemies as his footstool? Does Jesus want to sit on the throne and put his feet on his enemies? Is that the Jesus that we really know? I don't think that's a Quranic teaching or really a true teaching about Jesus. Uh, Daniel 3 says, one like the Son of God. From the Quranic perspective, there is nothing like God. So if there is a Son of God and there is one like him, then they are two of the same kind. They cannot be the unique God. So I don't think any of these passages really prove this point. Did Jesus die for the sins of the world? Well, from the Quranic perspective, nobody dies for anyone's sins. God can forgive whoever he wants very freely and openly. And he does so in response to our plea of repentance. When a person decides to return from sin and turn towards God and repair the wrong that we have done to others, God is willing to forgive us. Think about the story of the prodigal son, Luke chapter 15. This son had disobeyed his father, but when he comes back and his father sees him in the horizon, the father says, quick, slaughter a fatted calf, let's have a banquet. Give him a new robe on his shoulders. Put a ring on his finger. The son who was with him says, Father, I've been with you serving you all this time. You never threw a banquet for me. But the father said, Son, you don't understand. This son of mine was lost. And today he comes back. Let's have a banquet. That story demonstrates that God does not require someone else to pay the price for sins. If somebody pays it, that means there is no forgiveness. In fact, if one were to use the analogy of a judge, human judges have limited authority. And that is why they cannot forgive freely. But even they, with their limited authority, can use their discretion in the case and, in fact, let a person off. That is possible. God, who is the judge of judges, can see the circumstances of a person. And if a person is really repentant, showing remorse, even human judges let a person off. What about the judge of judges, the most merciful of those who show mercy, God Almighty? He can forgive. In fact, what sense does it make to say that in order for God to forgive, he had to punish his innocent son? It, it, it doesn't look very good from the Muslim perspective, and this is one of the reasons actually I would prefer the Quran. Uh, James spoke about a lot about the, the uh, fruits, and he referred to uh, the Prophet Muhammad, according to a story, slaughtering uh, some Jews. And he's incorrect about saying that uh, Jews uh, were the residents of Medina. They lived actually on the outskirts of Medina. They were the Aus and the Khazraj. They were Arab peoples who lived uh, in, in Medina itself. Uh, the Prophet Muhammad, according to historical records which are outside of the Quran, some of them reliable, some of them not, had many altercations with the Jews. He, drew, he, he exiled one tribe and then another tribe and then the third tribe, according to one historical report, uh, he had them all put to the sword. But I doubt that that report is correct because the verses of the Quran which deal with captives actually show the contrary. They've referred to one of these passages uh, in Surah 8 verse number 67. Uh, many people understand this passage as saying that the Prophet Muhammad is supposed to actually enact great slaughter in the land. But I read it the opposite and saying that it is not right for a prophet to do that. In fact, that should be interpreted in the light of Surah 47 verse number 4 where it is very clear that the... In, in the heat of war, people get killed on both sides. But when the war lays down its burdens, then the Muslims are to bind the captives and then either ransom them for a price or let them go freely. Nothing there about killing. It so happens that in Surah 33, there is a mention uh, about the altercation between the Prophet Muhammad and the people known as the Banu Qurayza. And it said, some of them you killed and some of them you took captive. So the commentators went wild with that and said, oh, well, there has to be a group that was killed. And uh, they made a story out of it. This is how I would interpret that. I don't believe that this is a proper historical reminiscence that the Prophet Muhammad massacred these people the way we read about uh, Elijah. And you must remember that Elijah's story is part of the Bible. So a Christian has to deal with that. But this story about these people that Dave was referring to is not in the Quran. Uh, this is something that some Muslims may accept and some, like myself, would reject. I don't believe that as a true representation of what the Prophet Muhammad did or of what we should do uh, today. 
Dave, in fact, uh, makes too many blunders about the Quran. He says, for example, in Surah 26, it says that all poets are inspired by Satan. It doesn't say that. It says about poets in general, but there are exceptions. A poet may not actually be inspired by Satan, and the ones who are, are described there in a, as those who follow every story with, uh, without distinguishing between credible stories and incredible ones. And of course, we've seen that uh, partly Dave is doing some of that uh, as well. Uh, they, that Allah is the one God uh, in Arabia that was the high God is well established in all scholarly writings from the period. There is nothing that I know of that says that Allah was one of the idols in the Kaaba, except a book that is sold on, on um, uh, Dave's website by Moshe, who is, uh, who is Allah, and uh, a, a book written by Dr. Robert Morey, whom I had the good pleasure of debating some, uh, year ago, some years ago, and in, whose, uh, to, in response to whom I wrote a, a, a booklet entitled uh, Robert Morey's uh, Moon God Myth and Other Deceptive Attacks on Islam. So some people feel that they have to distance Islam from Christianity and John Gilchrist explained why this is so. Because they see that Islam is coming from within, holding many of the same beliefs and at the same time questioning some very important ones. So one needs to, to either have a good answer for that or to say that Islam is so strange you need not pay any attention to it. Start with Allah, he is not Yahweh uh, of the Bible. But of course every historian of religion will agree that Allah of the Quran is the Yahweh of the Bible. We differ with Christians in that Christians say that Yahweh had a son and we say that Yahweh, whom we call Allah, did not have a son. Thank you. A, a five minute response, please. Yeah, thank you. Whoops, reset. Okay. Well, I have to give uh, Shabir credit. He can talk a lot faster than I can and cover a lot of points. But he's not giving us um, the full story. He is going to go for the Jesus of the Quran instead of the Jesus of the Bible. Well, the Jesus of the Bible, we have eyewitnesses. Quran says he, he didn't die, he wasn't crucified. The Bible says he did. And we have eyewitnesses who testify to this. The Quran says he didn't rise from the dead. The Bible says he did. These are eyewitnesses speaking. Now you understand the difference between the disciples who died as martyrs and the suicide bombers. The difference is that the, there are many people who will die out of loyalty for their uh, religion or, or their leader and so forth. The disciples did not die out of loyalty to Jesus. They died as witnesses to something. They died as, in fact, Jesus said, you will be my witnesses. And P Paul said, we all of us have to die. Not everyone else, <laughs> necessarily, but we apostles are the first appointed unto death. Why was that? Because I'll tell you, that evidence will stand up in any court. No one is fool enough to die for what he knows is a lie. And the apostles died testifying, yes, he did rise from the dead. We didn't steal his body and hide it in Peter's basement. He did rise from the dead. He did heal the sick. He did walk on water. Uh, he, he was hated and, and so forth, like the prophets uh, foretold. Hated and despised and so forth. Uh, now, they died testifying to these facts. Uh, each one with the possible exception of John. No one is fool enough to die for what he knows is a lie. Now we have very powerful evidence for what the Bible says. We have the Quran talking about, no, he wasn't crucified and so forth. 600 years after, you don't have one witness to cite. Uh, it's, well, I gave you some reasons for having uh, some uh, questions about the inspiration. Uh, of, of the Bible, lest he be angry and you perish from the way. Well, God is angry with the wicked every day, the Bible says, and I think he has good reason uh, to be angry. Uh, and the prodigal son, that's not the whole story. Yes, he, he forgave his son and so forth. Um, but the Quran has uh, more than a hundred verses advocating violence. Now, we would have to sit down and look at each one of these. 
um, did this man who, he says, I, that's not the story I got, who repented and went back to Islam? I don't think so. That's not what I get from history. Uh, I'm citing Will Durant, for example, one of the world's uh, leading, uh, uh, leading historians. What he's talking about, the millions that were killed, uh, that's not the Hadith, that's not some hearsay. Uh, but now we're asked to go back and we're going to accept the Quran, which has no eyewitnesses, it has no prophecies fulfilled to support it. Uh, and we're going to just take what Muhammad said. You know, he's only one. There are 40, um, 39 other witnesses for each prophet of the Bible. And we must take what Muhammad said, although he wasn't certain to begin with, he thought he was even being inspired of Satan, there are contradictions in the Quran, and it certainly contradicts the Bible uh, in many ways, which I don't, can't talk fast enough to cite them all. So what are we being asked tonight? Well, you're, going, you're asked that just believe that Allah is the true God and that Allah is merciful, and whatever you've done, doesn't matter. Uh, you just tell Allah, I'm sorry, and really be sincere about it, and he will wipe it out. I don't think that's the way justice works, and I don't believe that it works out in real life as well. A person can promise uh, that they'll turn over a new leaf and say that they are sorry, but that doesn't really change their heart. Uh, and the Bible has a way of changing the heart if we put our faith in Christ. Thank you. Uh, we're, we are transformed. Thank you. Shabir Ali, five minutes. Thank you. Well, I think I'll have to speak a little bit slower just to keep the balance here going. As slow as this. <laughs> well, were there really eyewitnesses to the crucifixion that can testify to a truth that is contrary to what the Quran proclaims? I understand the Quranic verse, Surah 4, verse 157, not to deny that Jesus was put on the cross, but to deny that he was killed by his enemies on the cross. If one wants to assert the contrary, one would have to have good evidence that Jesus actually died on the cross. But you, 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 do you realize how little evidence we have of that? Because the Gospels are written in such a way that when we read them together, we realize that all of the incidents that are narrated in them cannot be all true at the same time. For example, the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, tell us about this great earthquake, and then Matthew's Gospel says that at this time the, uh, the saints came back to life. You had this great dawning of the dead, but they remained there until Jesus resurrected. Then they went into the city and they were seen by many. So now, in the light of all of this great earthquake and everything, you can well imagine that if you're there on the scene, you'd be thinking, man, this guy was innocent. What are we doing here, killing this guy? And that's what has happened in Luke's gospel. You can see the chief priests and all of that beating their chests, and they go away thinking what wrong they have done. But, but you cannot put all of them together. You cannot have them plotting and conniving the way they're doing in Matthew's gospel if you have them repentant and sorrowful they, they are, they are, the way they are in Luke's gospel. More than this, would a Roman centurion, they're standing there seeing this great earthquake and the sky was darkened for three hours straight, now take a spear and thrust Jesus in the side? Would anyone dare? S mentioning this uh, spear thrust is actually doing so, so for theological purposes. He's not recounting history. Barring this spear thrust then, which was not historical uh, as an event, what would have pierced Jesus' vital organs? What would have caused his death? Crucifixion does not cause a quick death, but a slow one, over several days sometimes. According to the Gospels, he hung for a few hours in one day. What then was the cause of his death physiologically? Nothing is recounted. This is why Pilate doubted when he heard that Jesus had died. But Pilate may have had his own reasons for letting Jesus go as, as lightly as is possible so that he could save his own skin. That's on the one hand. What proof do you have that Jesus actually died? Nothing. On the cross, that is. I mean, you, you 
if you buried him and, and, and put six um, uh, feet of dirt over him, then he would certainly be dead. But that's not what they did. They put him in an, in, a, in an airy chamber, in a tomb. And then it is reported that people said that they saw him, but only the disciples of Jesus. And if one were to compare the Gospels, one would see that there is such fierce disagreement between them. Luke's Gospel says that when Jesus appeared to them on that Easter Sunday, he said to them, stay in the city until you receive the promise, which will come at Pentecost, some 50 days later. In the meantime, Matthew says, and Mark promises, but doesn't deliver, that Jesus will appear to his disciples in Galilee. So either they're going to Galilee to see Jesus immediately, or they're staying in Jerusalem, as, Mark, as, as Luke says. You cannot have it both ways. And in the end, it looks like this is not really based on good eyewitness testimony. What about the disciples dying for the fact that they bore witness that Jesus rose from the dead? Well, is that really why they died? The only account we have of a person actually dying uh, at the hands of the enemies in the early church is actually Stephen, and he's in fact the first martyr. Well, the account. We are told that other people died, but we're not shown the account of why and how they died. But the circumstances of Stephen's death are, are, are described in Acts of the Apostles, chapter 7 and chapter 8. And it is evident there that the reason Stephen died was because they accused him of defiling the temple. And speaking against the law of Moses, it wasn't because he claimed that Jesus resurrected from the dead. What reason do we have then for assuming, as apologists for the Christian faith commonly assume and preach, that uh, the disciples died because they said that Jesus resurrected from the dead? In fact, the, the, the guards who were at the tomb went back to the chief priests, according to uh, Matthew's gospel, and told them about the angel who came down and rolled away that stone. Obviously, you have a, a proof here of the resurrection of the dead. If you want any, these guys must have believed it. And they were advised by the priest, just say that the disciples came and stole away his body. But they know, knew the truth, and yet they were paid to keep silent. They weren't killed. In fact, it in, in turns out on, on final analysis that we have no proof either that Jesus finally died on the cross or that he actually came back to life after he was dead at any point. And in short then, the Quranic uh, narrative on this is, I believe, dependable and believable. Thank you. Dave Hunt, you have uh, five minutes to conclude. Really? <laughs> we have the Quran 600 years after the event no eyewitnesses somehow it has the true story now he says they didn't die for testifying to Jesus Christ indeed they did uh, I mean the Romans were very broad minded you could have uh, any number of gods if you wanted, and all the disciples would have had to do was say Jesus was another god, and that would be accepted. But they died because they said he is the only true God. He is the way, the truth, the life. No man comes unto the Father but by him. He di they died because they testify to who Jesus is, and that included the miracles that he'd done, and to raise a question, oh, we don't know for sure whether he really died on the cross. I mean, this is the foundation of, of the gospel, and it's foretold in the Old Testament, uh, and Paul writes about it in 1 Corinthians 15, uh, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, it was foretold, was buried, rose again the third day according to the scriptures. He says there were 500 witnesses. He says, if Christ didn't die for your sins, you are yet in your sins. The penalty hasn't been paid. It's the very foundation uh, of the Christian gospel and all of the sacrifices in the Old Testament were foretelling this. They were examples of an innocent victim that had to die, not that the blood of bulls and goats could take away sin. The Bible is very clear on that, but they were foretelling, looking forward uh, to the death, uh, burial, and resurrection of Christ. And now the Quran says, well, but we know, uh, we weren't there, but we know, because the Quran says, well, he didn't really die, and this spear, well, that was just kind of a prick to uh, see if he was uh, still alive, and so forth. Uh, it doesn't add up. 
And they died for telling this story. They were witnesses to the miracles that Christ did. They were witnesses to the resurrection. They were given the opportunity to deny their faith. They weren't thrown into the lions, uh, into the stadium or whatever, but they had the opportunity to, to uh, well, not one of them said, wait a minute, don't tell, don't kill me, I'll tell you the truth. We made the whole thing up and we stole his body and we hid it in Peter's basement. Just like the soldiers said, well, uh, uh, Shabir says, they were paid to do that. Uh, well, but the disciples weren't paid to do it. You couldn't buy the disciples off. They knew for sure that Jesus Christ is God. He raised the dead. He could walk on water. He could feed 5,000 with a few loaves and fishes and so forth. And the disciples were absolutely certain of this. Otherwise, why would they testify to this? What were they getting out of this? Uh, they're, all they're getting is persecution. That's all Jesus promised them. Jesus said, if you are true to me, you will be hated and persecuted just like they did to me. And this was why they were uh, martyred for, for their faith. So to say that, well, no, we're not really sure because the Quran says, Surah 4, 157, well, they killed him not, but it appeared to be so, and Allah apparently deceived. He's not supposed to be a deceiver. I guess Allah deceived people into thinking that Jesus had been crucified. So the foundation of the Christianity is a deception from Allah, uh, and these poor disciples believed that, and that was the foundation of the Christian faith that spread throughout all the world? I don't think so. I don't think that they would die for a lie. And the Bible is very clear. This is the foundation of the Christian faith. This is what the gospel is all about. And now we're asked to throw that out because Surah 4, 157, 40 words in that one place uh, in the Quran, rather indistinct as to exactly what it means, that's what we're going to accept now, 600 years after the event, without any witnesses. I don't think so. Thank you. <laughs> and five minutes for Shabir Ali to conclude. In these five minutes, I want to just retrace our steps and find out what uh, we can conclude from what was discussed here tonight. Um, both uh, Dave and I have tried in our own ways to explain the reasons for our faith and to defend what we believe in. But finally, it is by the, total, the totality of what I have said and what Dave had said that we should all be informed uh, with uh, today. And our conclusion should be based on all of these. In my own way, I try to explain why I b would choose the Quran if I had to over and above the Bible. I would prefer, on the other hand, to have both books, benefit from both. But I've tried to show that even though many people think that the Quran is a violent book, and by contrast, the Bible must be a peaceful one, especially it is, uh, since it is represented by a faith today, which is characterized by Jesus, who uh, is known to be the pr Prince of Peace. I should, on the contrary, that one, when one looks carefully at the issues that are common to both the Bible and the Quran, one can see that the Quran is, in fact, a peaceful book, and uh, I regret to say that the Bible has passages which are quite violent. For example, God's promise to Abraham, which meant that the people in that land would have to be destroyed and displaced, in the words of Dave himself. Uh, we saw a Moses story, where Moses commands his followers to kill off all of the people, except for the young girls who have not yet known a man, because these virgins are to be saved for the male soldiers. Joshua, at the wall of Jericho, the walls came tumbling down, but then the people got massacred as well. Joshua and his, uh, and his uh, army uh, killed off everything that uh, breathed in that, uh, in that town. And then David, uh, he was reprimanded for his uh, adultery with Bathsheba, but he wasn't reprimanded for killing 200 Philistines, uh, taking off their foreskins and using that as the bridal price to get married. 
Samson uh, killing 3,000 who were on the roof, and we don't know how many more were inside in a suicide uh, mission, actually may, may be a kind of uh, inspiration for Muslim, uh, Muslim suicide uh, bombers if they would bother to read the Bible. I hope they don't read a story like that and get inspiration from it, uh, because obviously we all have the better sense than to do something so uh, violent and then say that it is by, by God that we're doing it. Uh, we have seen uh, the story of Elisha and uh, how he uh, prayed or cursed the children and as a result uh, two she-bears came out and mauled 42 children. Apparently God is in league with these prophets doing these violent things even to children. Elijah slaughtering 450 priests, uh, 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 prophets of Baal in one shot. Uh, we have uh, looked at the fact that the New Testament even praises these uh, figures like Samson and David and Jephthah and the others. These were supposed to be great men. Uh, we have looked at the passages dealing with women and we have seen that in the Quranic story of Eve, even Eve isn't blamed for the sin of Adam, but in the Bible she is. And as a result of that, we have all of these uh, pontifications from the writers who will tell us Eve was the one who brought the sin into the world it wasn't Adam who was deceived it was Eve that of course has implications for how women will be viewed not only Eve but Delilah and again and again we find that the stories of women are so painted that women come out in a bad light that could not be the truth there are some good women and bad women good men and bad men and we should hear both sides but we always hear about the bad women starting with uh, Eve. Somebody wrote a book actually, All the Bad Girls of the Bible. And we've seen that there are passages, in fact, with, which are quite demeaning to women, like the fact that a man could sell his daughter uh, as a slave, uh, that a priest's daughter should be killed, burned to death if she uh, commits adultery, that a woman would be brought to, to her father's house uh, for, uh, to be penalized, to be stoned for, to death for adultery. And this, of course, resembles what we're worried about in our present times by way of honor killings. In short, I think from my presentation, I am still satisfied and convinced that if I'm to choose between the two books, it would have to be the Quran. But I don't want to choose between the two of them. I use both books. Muslim commentators on the Quran have used the Bible to fill out the stories that are briefly told in the Quran because those stories are told more extensively in, in the Bible. So Muslims can benefit from both. What about the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus? I believe that if one were to look at the New Testament writings very carefully, it will be hard to be convinced that Jesus actually died on the cross and that he rose again from the dead. There are other explanations which are more likely and uh, the Quran speaks about God rescuing Jesus and raising him to himself and ultimately requiring that Muslims should believe in Jesus and if we do not we cannot be true followers even of the Quran. So the Quran calls us back to faith in Jesus. Thank you. Thank you gentlemen. Now we have questions which I will read out. Um, how do you explain the New Testament comments about women not speaking in the church? Well, I believe that the New Testament is God's word. I'm going to offend the ladies. But the reason that it's given is uh, it's not to speak in leadership uh, that it says Adam was first formed, then Eve. Now, the Bible does blame Adam, <clears throat> not Eve. Uh, the, woman, the woman was deceived, but that Adam was not deceived. He didn't want to lose his wife, so he went along with it. Actually, his sin was worse. But the Bible does it, blame Adam. It says, um, Romans 5, 12, For by, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, so death passed upon all men, and, and so forth. So, I mean, women can get pregnant. Uh, they should t be t nursing and caring for their babies. Be pretty tough to be a, a leader uh, and, and speaking and so forth. There could be some uh, reasons of that nature. But it says, Eve was deceived. And Adam was not, he went along with it. And for that reason, I mean, look, uh, you got two people, we, most of us out there are married. Uh, you got a 50-50 vote? Well, you'll never solve it. Uh, someone has to be the leader. Someone has to, unless it's three to two, I mean three to one, 
Someone has to be the leader. And the Bible, this is what God says. I accept what he says. He says the man should take the leadership in the home and in the church. You ladies don't like that? Women's lib? Okay, but this is what God says. Both the Bible and the Quran say Jesus was born of a virgin. I have the understanding that Muhammad was not born of a virgin. Does that say Jesus was superior to Muhammad? Does that say he was God? Well, uh, to begin with, I don't believe that that means that he is God. And in Christian theology, actually, the virgin birth does not prove the divinity of Jesus, uh, although many uh, Christians seem to misunderstand this subtle point. If Jesus is God, he was God from all eternity. He doesn't become God at some point, especially at the virgin birth or any, any other time. Uh, one might say that it's more appropriate if God was to enter the world that he enters through this particular way, through a virgin birth. But who's to say that that's the mo most appropriate? If God wanted to assume flesh and enter the world, why could he not assume flesh uh, through a usual birth? I, so I don't believe that the virgin birth by itself proves the divinity of Je Jesus. Uh, on the other hand, I don't believe that this also by itself would prove that Jesus is superior to the prophet Muhammad. Unless one takes virgin birth as an automatic sign that some person is superior. But if we think about God being uh, the power behind everything and Jesus being the agent through which God does certain things or to whom God does certain things as for example in the virgin birth, well then Jesus is the object through, uh, of God's action. And the, the power to bring a person into the world by a virgin birth actually belongs to God, not to Jesus. And in that case, the virgin birth of Jesus doesn't prove uh, Jesus' own superiority or power, but it proves this, the, the superiority and power of God, who created both Jesus and Muhammad. Uh, to Muslims, uh, what uh, makes the Prophet Muhammad more unique uh, for us is the fact that God sent him last, and in that case, uh, we can look towards his teachings as the culmination of all of the teachings of the previous prophets, including that of the Prophet Jesus. Many Muslims think of the Prophet Muhammad as being superior to all of the prophets because of his being placed last in this way. But uh, there are reports going back to the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, in which he himself dissuades Muslims from saying that he is superior to other prophets, and the Quran itself tells Muslims not to differentiate between the prophets. We accept them all, they're prophets of God, and we should not be in the business of comparing and saying that this prophet is greater than the other one. We accept the messages of all of them in principle, and finally, in detail, follow that uh, which was revealed to the last of all of the prophets. Question for you, Shabir. According to numerous hadiths, Muhammad married Aisha when she was six years old and had intercourse with her when she was nine. He was over 50 at the time. Was the act moral in the eyes of Allah? In, in ancient times, people actually got married much earlier than, than we would uh, accept as uh, reasonable today. Uh, usually a Jewish girl, for example, did her bat mitzvah at 13 years old or sometimes 12 years old and she was considered suitable for marriage. So Mary was already betrothed to Joseph. She was probably only 12 years old at the time. Uh, in, in Arabia, perhaps uh, girls did get married earlier because there were no high schools to attend, no university degrees to pursue, and a woman's uh, prime contribution to her uh, tribe might have been to bear children uh, perhaps more so sons who would defend uh, the uh, tribes in battle. However, having said that, the report about this is found in some of the Muslim sources outside of the Quran, and Muslims may doubt the authenticity, authenticity of some of these reports. Rukhaya Waris Maksud uh, has actually written a pamphlet on this, which might be found in some of the internet sites, in which she analyzes some of the reports, and she found that, in fact, uh, there was some mistake in the dates, and it seems that Aisha might have been 16 at the time when she got betrothed to the Prophet and 19 at the time of the consummation of the marriage. Some other researchers have given some other variant dates uh, such as this as well. Try and get one for, for, for Mr. Hunt here. Uh, you spoke about horrible things that Muslims do to each other and you assume that they represent true Islam, yet you completely ignore all the horrible things that have been done in the name of Christianity, slavery, residential schools, etc., etc. How can you dismiss these things yet attack Oops, it says, <laughs> attack things that so-called Muslims do. Well, I don't dismiss these things. But I say that this is not what the Bible teaches. This is not the example of Jesus Christ. Uh, so um, when the Crusaders, for example, they invade 
the land and they slaughter people. Uh, they're going to take Jerusalem, not to give it back to the Jews to whom God gave it, but to take it for the church. They are doing that in disobedience to the, to the word of God and disobedience to the teaching and disobedience of the example of Jesus. Uh, when the Muslim uh, takes over uh, all the way from France to China, he is doing that in obedience to the prophet Muhammad. This is how he began his career, in obedience to the teaching of Muhammad. And as I understand it, and Shabir would, would disagree, the teachings of the Quran. So there is a difference. Uh, and there is a distinct territory, the Canaanites, and we have the uh, boundaries of that land are given in Genesis 15. It doesn't say to the Jews, take over the whole world. But I uh, cited Muhammad, and I, I, I think this is the Sahih Bukhari Hadith, uh, which I understood that the Muslims said is very authentic and really if you have to understand the Hadith uh, or you can't really understand the, the Quran, this is the background to it. But he said, Allah has commanded me to fight against all people. That includes the United States or Canada. Until all people confess there's no God but Allah and Muhammad is his prophet. Uh, so I think there's a, a, a big difference. But what you do in obedience to God and what you do in disobedience to God and his word and the example and teaching of Jesus, we have to distinguish between that. I suppose what the question is getting at is in spite of or because of. And it, it's not that difficult to understand that people abuse religion. People abuse democracy. They abuse love. They abuse all the wonderful things in life. Some argue in some of these questions, a lot of repetition, the premise is crimes committed in the name of Christianity are in spite of the teachings of Jesus, whereas crimes committed in the name of Islam are committed in the name of Islam and inspired directly by the Quran. Well, one has to understand the historical circumstances in which the New Testament was written. And the New Testament was written by Christians who were persecuted by Roman authorities. Uh, they did not have um, the wherewithal to uh, preach uh, that they are going to take over the world. But in ancient times, um, everyone was struggling with everyone else to take over the world. And if they had the power to do so, they would do so. Uh, Dave was saying only the land of Canaan. But actually, according to the Bible, it's from the Nile Valley all the way to the Euphrates River. It's a large stretch of land and it's the fertile crescent. That's what people desired to have at that time. And uh, the Bible was giving that to, to, to the Jews and telling them to go and take it over in in this violent onslaught massacring all of the residents there. Uh, if, according to Christian theology, the God of the New Testament is the same as the God of the Old Testament. If he did it once, he can do it again. Why doesn't he do it in the New Testament? Because Christians do not have power uh, to, uh, to assert themselves in that way, so they take another tack. Uh, they praise the government. So in Romans and in First Peter, they say the government is good. It's the instrument of God's power to enact justice on the land. Speaking of the Roman government, which was actually persecuting Christians and hauling them into Rome and courts and forcing them to commit adultery, uh, sorry, idolatry, uh, and uh, it would be funny, wouldn't it? <laughs> uh, uh, idolatry, and, uh, and, and these are the governments that are being praised as the instruments of God. Obviously, they have exaggerated the other way, and they have represented Jesus as, a, as being of no threat to the Roman powers at all, whereas, in fact, the subtext is that Jesus will come back, and he will wipe out all of the powers in, in a violent slaughter of his enemies, and he will rule by sitting on David's throne. He would realize the dream which the Jews never realized of having the kingdom of God here on earth. In fact, the peace that, that Dave thinks is, is possible, the only peace Dave thinks is possible for Christians, as he has written in his book, uh, Countdown to the Second Coming, is that in which it is envisioned that Jesus rules uh, after this violent slaughter. Any other peace activity by Christians he deems to be uh, uh, not faithful to the teachings of, of Christ. And Dave can perhaps elaborate on that. Would you like to respond to that? Well, I don't teach that the only peace uh, will be uh, under Christ ruling on the throne of David. Uh, in fact, that <clears throat> is not what the Bible teaches. I believe the Bible teaches that the uh, millennial reign of Christ 
is not going to bring perfection to this world. This is the final, the ultimate proof of the incorrigible evil of the human heart. So that here is Christ in his resurrected glorified body. And you have Christians in their resurrected glorified bodies. Some of them have been raptured and they haven't even been resurrected, but they have glorified bodies. Here you have the proof laid out before you. Satan is, is bound. You know, people say, well, if I'd been in the Garden of Eden, I wouldn't have done it. Well, this is better than the Garden of Eden. Satan can't even invade uh, the, the earth on the, under the millennial reign of Christ. You have all the proof you could ever want. And what happens? As soon as Satan is loosed, it says he deceives the nations, and they come like the sand of the sea against Jerusalem, against Christ, to destroy him. So I think it's the final proof of the incorrigible evil in the human heart. And peace is not going to be brought about by Christ reigning on earth and forcing people to behave. It only comes about through a transformation of the heart. And I think this is the final evidence. For, but aren't you saying, that. Dave, and haven't you written in your books that that peace with Jesus reigning uh, on, on the throne of David only comes after this violent slaughter when Jesus returns after rapturing the true Christian believers and the Antichrist is let loose for a thousand years. Then Jesus comes back and finally demolishes the entire system and takes it all over. No, no, on the contrary. I say the contrary. For example, uh, this is not the ultimate kingdom because Jesus himself said, except a man be born again, he can't even see, much less enter into the kingdom of God. Even Nebuchadnezzar knew the uh, kingdom, your kingdom, he said to God, is an everlasting kingdom. Isaiah 9, 7 uh, says, of his kingdom and peace there will be no end. So it, it couldn't be the millennial reign because it, it, it ends. And there are, you know, flesh and blood, Paul says, 1 Corinthians 15, cannot inherit the kingdom of God. I think, Dave, uh, what you're avoiding is, isn't that peaceful reign of Jesus to be precipitated by Jesus entering the world and slaughtering his enemies? Well, uh, if you complain about that, uh, uh, you're complaining against God. Because the Bible, you know... No, I'm not complaining against that, no, no. but I'm saying that there is a parallel here which you have not observed. For, for, for Muslim fundamentalists who want to impose Islam on the world, to them the only peace is possible after Muslims conquer everything You're else right. and impose Islamic justice as they understand it. You're right. And the parallel yeah. is that you understand that the only peace that is possible and to which Christians can work for uh, is <laughs> that peace which will come after Jesus slaughters his enemies and, and sits on the throne of David. No, that's the millennial reign and that's not the only peace and Christians don't work for this. Uh, Christ wipes out the enemies because this is the just judgment upon them. Uh, but anyway, we can... Well, I guess we don't want to get into a long dialogue. Here. Oh, I was yeah, rather because enjoying Dave, I have well, well, your book, well, Countdown to the Second we'll Coming. Move on. We'll move on. This is an easy one uh, to both of you. Should Israel exist today? Please tell us why or why not. <laughs> well, I don't see why Israel should not exist. I do not agree with Muslims who think of uh, wiping Israel off the map or to use that sort of language. Uh, it, um, uh, Jews, Muslims, Christians, uh, e each have a right to live in God's uh, world, which is the entire world. Uh, we all have a right to life. The Quran insists on the right to life. Of course, uh, in, in Palestine, there's a dispute as to who should live where and, and to whom does the, long belo the land belong. Uh, Jews, armed with the Bible, insist that the land belongs to them. God gave them that land. Palestinians, who have lived in that land for uh, many centuries, insist that if uh, Jews had not been around for so many hundreds of years, uh, perhaps 1800 years, and then they finally come back and say this is our land because God gave it to our forefathers, this seems to be a like a religious claim and it was only valid for those who believe in that particular book. Uh, so uh, it would be very strange if somebody comes to where we live and says, look, I have a religious book that tells me that God gave me the land on which you have built your house. So you get out and give me that land uh, because that's God's uh, promise to me. Uh, it, that, that would be very strange and 
Palestinians obviously see that with the same degree of strangeness, and uh, other Muslims seeing Palestinians as their brethren are wondering about the injustice of it all and wondering why other people are, are supporting the, the Israelites in, in moving into and taking up and occupying more land. And of course, it is understandable to me now after reading Dave's books because I, I, I understand well, part of what is happening there that I didn't understand before, that people believe that God gave them that land. But if one reads the, 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 the biblical uh, passages, then uh, how, does, how is that different from somebody uh, going into a land saying, I'm going to kill everybody that lives there, take over the land, and then if we ask them why, they say, well, God gave us this land. How is that different from what is described in the biblical passages? Okay. So, well, well, I explain that situation. God gave them the land because of the wickedness of those people. Now, I don't understand that. I don't know all the details, but he even told Abraham, your descendants cannot have this land. I cannot give it to, to them because the Canaanites, the Amorites are not so evil now that I would be justified in wiping them out. Now, I quoted verses, partial verses from the Quran, uh, where Allah says, we gave this land to the Jews, to the children of Israel, the chosen people, and, and so forth. Now, about Palestinians, this was the land of Israel. 130 A.D., the Romans who destroyed Jerusalem in 70 A.D. began to rebuild it as a pagan city dedicated to Jupiter. And they started to build the Temple to Jupiter on Temple Mount. That upset the Jews, naturally. That's where the temple was. Now you're putting a pagan temple up there. There was an uprising. It was successful for uh, a short time. And, but the Romans brought in a, a little more legions. They wiped out a thousand Jewish villages. They sold, uh, half, uh, killed a half a million people, sold thousands into slavery. And in anger, because of this uprising, the Romans renamed Israel. It was the land of Israel up until that time. They renamed Israel Provincia Syria Palestina. And from that time on, everyone who lived there was uh, a Palestinian. Who lived there? Jews. There was not an Arab in that land at all at that time. Uh, this is before the Quran even came along, before Muhammad was born. Uh, now, I quote, if you, you say you read this, I quote uh, Ahmed Shukeri, for example. Uh, in, this is 1956, testifying to the United Nations. He's a, an Arab leader. And he says, we, and I quote other Arab leaders, we Arabs are not Palestinians. There's no such place as Palestine. That was 1956. 1964, Shukeri changed his tune. And the the Arabs began to say, oh no, we are descended from the original Palestinians. We are the Palestinians. And Shukari, as you know, became the founding chairman of the Palestine Liberation Organization. After saying eight years before, there's no such place as Palestine, no such people as Palestinians. And he was the one who coined the phrase, we will drive the Jews into the sea. Okay, so... <clears throat> Palestinians? No, they are not Palestinians. I explained it. Who's the father? Abraham, he was an Iraqi, a Chaldean. Who's the mother? Uh, 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 she's an Egyptian. You got a, a Chaldean father, an Egyptian mother. When they arrive in this land, this is talking about uh, Ishmael now. When they arrive in this land, it's inhabited by Canaanites. And you dare to say, we're descended from Ishmael, we're descended from the original Palestinians, at no such place, I, no such people. Can I ask you both the question, in <clears throat> both religions, and many other religions, have ju justice as a central theme. Putting aside the historical uh, claims, the reality is uh, coexistence, a clumsy coexistence. How, in a practical, loving manner, and we come from faith, but we, we claim are loving, do we deal with a situation where, as a matter of fact, whatever you want to call them, they call themselves Palestinians, people who were living there are no longer living there and feel they want to return. How would you, as a Christian, deal with that issue? Well, let me just give you some simple facts. <clears throat> Number one, the Jews did not chase them out. That's a lie. It was broadcast over the Arab radio, get out, all Arabs get out, we're coming in. The Arabs got up and walked out of the UN when the UN 
partitioned this land and gave such, so much to the Jews and so much to the Arabs. They said the Jews cannot have any of this land. We were going to wipe them out. Okay, so this was their peaceful solution. Now, what is Israel's response? They try to defend themselves. Uh, it, they take some territory. I mean, all you've got is a narrow strip of land. You need some. These people are going to attack again. So we need some higher ground. We need some base from which to defend ourselves. The Arabs rejected that. Now the Arabs say, oh, well, yeah, yeah, let's go back to that original one. I don't know of any nation that lets an enemy that is determined to destroy you. They say okay. they must be wiped out. That's right. not the peaceful solution. Response from Shabir? Well, the difficulty we're having is that uh, UN resolutions one after another have been violated by Israel. It is true that the Arabs are also have faults and, and they also are insistent on what they want and refusing to budge and compromise. And the way forward is obviously for the, um, for the Arabs to compromise and for the is Israelites to uh, abide by the UN resolutions. You have an international body uh, that is looking into the justice of the situation and making resolutions and if you don't follow those then how can you expect that justice will be uh, will, will be put into place. Uh, it, is, it, it is never to be forgotten, of course, that the initial impetus for this and the initial problem uh, is the, the, uh, the, the migration of Jews from, from Europe and elsewhere into Israel, taking up land that was already occupied at the time. So, and this is the sort of injustice that we saw was inherited from the biblical narrative. The biblical narrative just simply said to, that God promised Abraham this land, and instead of uh, doing something for the people who already live there, the plan was, as uh, Dave says, to destroy and displace the people who are already residents there. So it looks like some people have come back with this idea that they are to destroy and displace the Palestinians who are already residents there and take over their land. If that is the idea, obviously they can be no peace. It'll be very difficult. But both sides have to step back and look at the broader picture and realize that as long as they continue struggling like this, they're in a lose-lose situation. To get to a win-win deal, they have to decide to share the land and make the best of what is possible there. Palestinian people in, in particular have to get out of the idea of uh, just simply uh, claiming what they believe is rightfully theirs and end up with nothing, uh, whereas they can find uh, positive ways of, of moving forward. As for the refugees, uh, one, near to, near to, close to one million refugees resulted from, from the invasions. Uh, and uh, those refugees have now multiplied through... Uh, uh, logical pro progression uh, to about 4 million. The refugees by, by international legal standards have to be uh, accommodated back into, into Israel and Israel is afraid if those Palestinian refugees are brought back into the country which is rightfully theirs, uh, they would outnumber the, the Israelites in voting and their democracy will fail. It will become an Arab uh, state. Uh, and uh, So one cannot have it you cannot have your cake and eat it too. You cannot say you're a modern democracy, you want fairness and justice, but you do not give the right to the people who, to whom the land already belonged. P the Palestinian people, regardless of their uh, ancient origins, had occupied that land. They lived there for hundreds of years. Jews came back now from Europe and they're claiming the land to be theirs by right of the title deed that they have, the Holy Bible. And the Palestinians do not believe in that the Bible can be used in this way to decide which land belongs to whom. They right. knew this land to belong to their forefathers for as long as they can remember. Let's go to another question. And so... Yeah. Uh, now they Let can me decide respond to share. once more. Yeah? Yeah. You're both okay. wrong, by the way, but go on. <laughs> Thank uh, you. Yeah. <laughs> now, who attacked whom? It was the Arabs who said, so, and they didn't even call themselves Palestinians then, you give Israel any part of this, and you're gonna, we're going to wipe them out, okay? Uh, Israel never attacked them. Uh, Israel always said, we want peace. But UN resolutions you're talking about, 242 and so forth, they, Israel must do this on the condition that the Arabs are willing to recognize the existence of Israel, and they have not done that. So then you can't say Israel violated... Let's ask one last question. I thought it would be bogged down in uh, the sort of thing that I no longer do on TV because you get bogged down. Uh, what happens to a Muslim who becomes a Christian, sir? Depends where he lives. If he lives in, if he lives in Canada, uh, he could be safe for a time. Um, but if he lives in Saudi Arabia, off with the head. That is the law. Now, if he lives in Pakistan 
or Egypt. I mean, I know what happens to people. A uh, Muslim wouldn't dare become a Christian there. I know that even Christian churches don't even want a Muslim who's become a Christian to come into their congregation because they're afraid of the reaction. Uh, so they have no freedom whatsoever. Uh, so it depends where you live. All right. Sir? Well, the apostasy law has been much misunderstood in Islam. It became a standard law that the apostate should be put to death. And this was widely accepted in, in, in all of the major fixed schools. But if one were to uh, look carefully at the basis of that law, one would see that it's very shallow. There is no basis for it in the Quran. Quite the contrary. The Quran speaks about people embracing Islam, leaving it, toying with it, going back and forth. And if the Prophet Muhammad himself were killing people for doing any such thing, they wouldn't dare to do it in Medina where the Prophet Muhammad had risen to power. So it is very clear from the Quranic evidence that uh, there should have been no such law in Islam that the apostate should be killed. Moreover, chapter 2 verse 256 in the Quran says categorically there is no compulsion in religion. And if you force a person to remain a Muslim by threatening death if he were to dare to leave, then obviously you're contradicting the Quran. So Muslims have become comfortable in, in, in some ways uh, in, in the acting contrary to the Quran. They have enacted laws and made them popular but that does not mean, mean that that is definitive uh, of, of what I I would want Islam to, to be and what I consider to be the religion of God as taught uh, in the Quran. There are lots of questions here but we've run over time. I'm sure both gentlemen will be here to answer questions and, 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 and chat with you further but please do show your appreciation uh, for these two. Thank you. Oh, thank you. You've been wonderful. <laughs>